Hey everyone, welcome to the channel. My name is Natter. In this video, we're going to go over the actual code implementation of our final capstone project, which is our adventure RPG, which we're going to build together in JavaScript. In the previous video, I went over kind of a holistic overview of things like the requirements, a little bit of a demo, some advice and some tips of how to structure the project. Um, in this video, we're actually going to go through the actual code implementation as well as kind of uh, how I specifically approached this problem uh, and then some things that came up along the way and kind of ways that we can maybe even improve this in the future. Um, I'm going to try to fit this all in one video because I feel like that might be a better experience than kind of splitting it up across multiple videos because I don't think the boundaries are as clear in this set of videos. Let's see how this goes. I hope that you enjoy it. Let's get right to the code together. Okay, so to start, I have the requirements that we saw last time on the screen. So again, just to kind of recap a little bit, we're building a command line uh, kind of a little RPG adventure game uh, where we're gonna be going through a little map. So this is kind of like an example. I had a few scenarios out for actually be building this. So uh, we don't need to spend too much time looking at this, uh, but effectively you wanna kind of create like a little grid here uh, and we wanna be able to move a little character like up and down and left and right. And uh, there's some encounters that we can meet along the way. Uh, and I mentioned that we're going to keep it really simple. And we're going to just uh, look for one specific type of item encounter and one specific type of enemy encounter and see if we can make it all the way to the top right uh, of our goal. We'll, we'll probably test it with smaller maps than this. And uh, we can have a variable size of maps with different widths and heights. Uh, but that's kind of the approach that we're going to take. So um, just a, a couple things to note again as we go through these requirements really quick before we jump to the code. Um, I already built this. Okay, um, and it took me, I don't know, like maybe half a day, a full day, depending on like uh, what parts of it I include in, in that process and uh, refactoring it and building these slides and thinking about it and all that kind of stuff. Um, so that that's me, right? And that, that, that is um, still a significant amount of time. Uh, so I don't anticipate you to do that anywhere near as fast as I'm coding it in this video, obviously, right? I, I literally have the code with me on my other screen and I'm going to be kind of doing a walkthrough uh, so that you don't have to watch me struggle through it like I did uh, when I was actually building this and testing different ideas. Um, I'm just kind of go through the final solution and kind of point out a few things along the way. So if you're looking at this and being like, oh my gosh, like how did he code this in like, you know, an hour or two hours or whatever it is? Uh, I didn't. Okay. Like it took me a, a, a bunch longer than that. Uh, and I would expect uh, someone who's just starting it to take uh, days, maybe even weeks to build this thing. Right. And, and the point is to get practice and experience uh, in building something a bit larger scope and also have fun along the way and see where you can increase and reduce the scope to make it easier or harder for yourself. Okay. So I just want to put that out of the way because it's super important to mention uh, so that you can maintain that confidence and don't feel like, you know, oh my gosh, you did it so quickly. Right. Um, so just to kind of recap the requirements, we're going to build uh, this command line application. All of this is in our terminal. We're not going to be building it in HTML or CSS uh, on our web page, for example. This is all in Node.js. Um, we're going to have our map, which is our kind of our grid, which we're going to walk through. We're going to build that out together, different variables, uh, width and height. Uh, we're going to try to make our player move from the bottom left to the top right. So that's kind of uh, our goal of the game. And we can do that by moving uh, kind of in the four directions, right up, down, left and right. Um, and as we move, we can encounter uh, either an enemy or an item or nothing happens, right? Most of the time, nothing happens, as I mentioned, uh, and we're going to kind of be able to play around with the different kind of uh, randomness to make the game have different experiences. Um, and we can have different uh, health points and attack points and defense, defense points for these different items and enemies in the player. And um, that's going to kind of make it either easier or harder, depending on how we actually tune the statistics for our game, which is going to make it quite fun. Um, so yeah, let's uh, let's just kind of get right to the code um, and see kind of how far we can get with this in one video together. So I'm going to pull up my VS Code here. Um, I'm probably uh, going to leave it as as you know. Usually I have it about this zoomed in. Um, sometimes I zoom it in one level further. I'm not going to do that for this video since I actually have my code on the other screen and it's already quite zoomed in. So it's going to be very hard for me to kind of concentrate if I have it even more zoomed in than that. So I hope that this is not too zoomed out. This is actually my normal level, uh, but uh, I hope that you can still read the code just fine. It's still pretty zoomed in. So to start, um, I just want to kind of think about you know. Like where where would be a good starting point for this? Um, because like as you're building these projects, I mentioned that a good thing to do would be to actually build like a UML diagram, right? Like a class diagram, like a player object and an enemy object and an item object and the grid and all these different things that you might think are in there. Um, so 
you probably did that and I hope that you did that because that's probably one of the most valuable things you can get out of uh, building something like this. Um, I'm not gonna do that. I'm just gonna jump right to the code just to show you kind of the end result of that process, right? As I mentioned a couple of times. So to start, you know what? I'm just gonna kind of maybe make a grid. Um, I don't actually know why I called this grid. Uh, I could have called it game or something like that, but you know what, let's go with grid just so I can keep it consistent with my notes here. So I'm gonna make a grid.js file, okay? And uh, in here, I'm going to just start immediately by making a class uh, called grid. And um, my goal is to see if I can kind of print out that grid to the screen, right? And uh, that grid effectively is like this grid right here that we saw in these pictures. Right, like a grid of trees where I can have in the top right my star, which is my goal, and the bottom left my little uh, monkey character. Right, so um, let's think of kind of how to do this. So I'm going to have a constructor, right, because this is a class, and this constructor is going to kind of do some stuff when we create this grid. And well, what do we want for this grid, right? We want the grid to have a width, most likely, and then a height. Now, you could have hard coded this, right? You don't technically need a width and a height. Um, you could have just set it like 10 to 10 or something. Um, but I'm just going to allow it to be a bit more dynamic so I can test different scenarios. Um, so let's kind of just go with this and see how far we can go if we all we have is a grid and a height, uh, a width and a height, so we can actually build out this grid together. So to start, I'm going to set these to the this object, just so if I do need access to it in other parts of um, the grid, uh, in other methods, I have access to it. So I can say this dot uh, width uh, is equal to the width that we just passed in, and then this dot height is equal to the height that we passed in. And uh, my editor is trying to enjoy some uh, CSS hints in there, but uh, we're not writing CSS. I don't know why it's getting confused. Um, Okay, um, then what we probably want to do is to see if we can actually draw out this grid, right? So I'm just gonna put some comments in here. Draw out the grid, or like create the grid, not really draw it out even. So I should probably just say uh, create the grid actually here. We're gonna draw it out in, in a second. Now there, there's really two ways that we can do this. There's like the a more like functional method, which is like a bit cleaner and, and, and like shorter syntax. Um, and then there's a more like imperative syntax where we can use for loops and things like that. Um, so I'm actually going to go with the longer method, which is the for loop method, because it's a bit more clear. And the uh, functional method, while it's much nicer, is definitely a bit uh, trickier to wrap your mind around. Uh, but if you're interested, definitely let me know and I can kind of share with you in the comments what that might look like. So I'm going to just say this dot grid is equal to an array to start. Okay. And what we want to really do is we want to create effectively a two dimensional array, right? Like if you think of how this looks like, we, th if you think of this as an array, right? It's got both a width and it's got a height, right? So it's really an array of arrays, right? Where each array, inner array is basically one of these, right? So that's, that's an array, that's an array, and then that's an array, etc. right? So we have a bunch of arrays stacked on top of each other, uh, and then that can create a two dimensional array. Right, so we, we basically need to create this two-dimensional two array somehow. Right now, this is a one-dimensional array. So I'm going to create a loop here. I'm going to say for let row is equal to zero, and uh, while the row is less than the height. So this gets tricky, but I'll let you kind of work out the logic. So we want to make sure that we uh, are creating that many rows, which is actually the height if you think about it. And we're going to make our row go up by one. Uh, we're going to enter a loop. <clears throat> now, since this is a two-dimensional array, each of these slots in the outer array, so if you think about this in the context of rows and columns, each row is going to have multiple columns, right? Where each row technically is an array with a size of this many items. Okay, so we need to create that inner array. So I'm going to basically say, uh, let, uh, like, let's just say, this row, for example, um, and that's going to be an array. And this is what we want to start um, adding items to to create effectively that row in this grid uh, where we're building out one row at a time. So now I'm going to actually create another loop here. I'm going to say for let column, uh, let's start at zero while the column is less than the width. Now, it seems a bit wonky if you think about the width and the height. You just, you intuitively think the width goes first, but you'll actually see uh, that it's the opposite, uh, which is why hopefully this column and rows uh, makes a little bit uh, of sense here for the naming. Um, then we want to say uh, this row uh, dot push. And well, what do we want to push onto it? Well, we want to push onto it um, like 
one of these objects, right? So for example, if I just push onto it a string, I'm gonna pull up my little emoji keyboard. So on a Mac, I believe that's like a uh, command, command control space, I think, command option space. I think it's command control space. I remapped my keys and I'm actually using Windows keyboard on a Mac. So it's very confusing for me what keys I'm actually pressing. I just remember where they are. Um, so if you don't actually know, definitely just Google for emoji picker. I think on a Windows, it's like uh, control, control something period. Um, you can probably Google it and find it pretty quickly. Um, so I'm just gonna pull that up. It should look like this on a Mac and on a PC, it looks pretty similar to this, just slightly differently styled. Um, I'm gonna kind of, you see <laughs> the most recently used ones here. Um, I'm just gonna kind of go with uh, one of these trees. All right, so um, I'm gonna push this tree uh, emoji as a string onto this row, right? Um, and that's gonna be basically building up this uh, set of trees for that row. Right, and then once I've built up that row, I'm gonna say this.grid.push, which is the actual grid itself, uh, we wanna push this row. So you can think of this as basically building up one row at a time with a bunch of trees, then putting it onto the grid, building up another row with a bunch of trees, then putting it onto the grid, and building another row with a bunch of trees, putting it onto the grid. And we're gonna have a bunch of these stacked on top of each other, we're gonna create our actual um, row. So, or actual grid, sorry. Um, then what we can do is see if this actually works. So I'm gonna do a console log here, and I'm gonna log this dot grid just to see how this looks like and then we'll remove this later. Um, so to actually create this object, uh, I need to create a new grid. And let's just say, I don't know, let's do maybe five by five, right? Uh, a five by five grid. Uh, make sure I'm in the correct folder here and I am. I'm gonna run node, uh, let's do grid in this case. And look at that, right? That's, that's pretty awesome. Um, we have a little five by five grid of trees, <laughs> right? Um, it, it just, it's just something beautiful about this, I don't know. Uh, maybe, maybe I get overly excited about seeing trees uh, on a black screen, um, but there you have it, right? It's uh, it's pretty wonderful. There are our emojis uh, all nicely laid out into a grid. So we already have something kind of looking like a little map, right? Um, now it's kind of ugly, right? It, arguably with these, uh, you know, square brackets and the, the kind of string stuff everywhere and the, the commas and stuff. So maybe we can clean that up. Okay, um, so so that, that's pretty good though. That's, that's a really, really good start, right? Um, and, and that might have taken you a while to get to that point, but um, I, I bet that once you finally saw that grid on the screen, uh, it must have been a really, really fun to look at. Um, so what I wanna do next before I actually kind of clean this up though, is I wanna see if I can actually put like my player here in the bottom left and then my uh, my goal here in the top right. Okay, so so let's, let's see how that might work. So I'm, I'm gonna say, uh, for, for my player, so let, let's do a player first. And it's gonna go on the bottom left, right? So the, the player is in the bottom left. So I'm gonna say this dot grid. So how do I kind of access the bottom left, if you think about it, using the, the kind of numbers that we have available, specifically the width and the height, because this can change, right? So, so our grid size can change. We wanna make sure that we're always in the bottom left. Now, if you think about this grid, well, what does the bottom left mean? That, that means right here, right? So that means the very last row and the first column, all right? So what that really means is if, if we take our height minus one because we're zero indexed and then we grab the zeroth item, which is the column in there, uh, that is actually equal to this spot right here, right? And hopefully you can kind of math that out and that makes a little bit of sense. Um, I'm gonna say that that's equal to, uh, let's just put a my little emoji in here. I'm gonna put my little monkey in there. All right, perfect. And, and then what I want is my uh, goal and this is in the, the top right. So uh, same thing here, uh, we're gonna say this dot grid and we want to grab this one right here, which is the very first row, right? But the last column. So the first row we know is zero. Right? But the last column is actually the width this time minus one, right? So um, if we do that, then I can put my star in here and that's just, uh, where's my, well, I guess I look for a star. Uh, I think it's that one right there. There we go, perfect. Um, let's try this again. So I'm going to uh, run node grid. Look at that, awesome. So uh, we have our monkey here, right? At the very start of our grid and we have our uh, star, which is our goal here in the, in the top right. So we need to eventually make our way through this forest uh, towards this goal. So that's, that's pretty darn cool.
Okay, um, so now let's see if we can actually clean this up a little bit so that this looks a little bit less clunky with our actual array and kind of commas and all that stuff going on. Okay, so I'm gonna make another uh, method inside of this grid class to actually display this grid so that I don't have to just deal with all this stuff. I can actually just call this method every single time I want to re-render basically or show this grid again every time something updates. All right, so logically I'm probably just gonna say this is called display grid. Um, or like render grid or whatever you think makes sense. Um, and in here, what we want to do is like basically draw this out, but without the array stuff. So, so we need to basically loop through this doc grid. Um, so I'm going to say uh, a, a double loop in here. I'm going to say for let row equal to zero. And while the row is less than this dot height, so very similar to what we just did right here. Right, except I'm using the this values now because I'm not in the constructor and I don't have access to the actual arguments being passed in to the constructor function anymore. Um, and then the row plus plus. Perfect. Um, and then I want to loop through the actual um, uh, columns, right? So I'm going to say for uh, let call equals zero while the call is less than this dot width this time. Uh, and then uh, call plus plus. Perfect. Um, and by the way, kind of as you're going through this, I should probably kind of add some extra commentary here. Uh, there's a lot of times maybe you'll go through like an interview or kind of a nested loop kind of question or a matrix kind of question or a two dimensional array or however you want to think about it. Um, and really, I think the most important thing is to make sure that you have good variable names. Uh, I think I think as simple as that, really, uh, a lot of time, if you uh, if you kind of mess up the variable names or, or you choose complicated very na na variable names or like I and J or uh, like index or things like that, um, it becomes very confusing as to whether you're referring to like the row or the column. Uh, so it really, really helps to actually give variable for good variable names for these rows and columns just like this right here. OK, um, OK. So uh, then what we want to do is we want to uh, console.log out the um, this.grid uh, at this spot, right? So at the uh, row and at the column. All right, so uh, there we go. That's pretty much what we want. Let's see if this actually works. So instead of uh, running console log here, I'm actually going to replace that with this.displayGrid. Right, so uh, this is just going to call basically my my function that's going to be console logging for me, right? And we can actually call this from anywhere now, and let's see if that actually works. So let's run this. Fingers crossed. Oh, that's not really what we want, right? Uh, I know that's a, a bit cut off by my uh, by my face here, but you can kind of see there's, not, there's definitely nothing over here in this area over here. It's all just one big line, right? So what is happening here, right? Um, well, the, the issue is that if you think about it, console log, right? Um, it, it prints out stuff for us. We're seeing that it's printing out stuff for us. But so we compare this to this. What's really happening is we are getting it printed out one at a time, but it's it's kind of ignoring the fact that these are all in one row, all together in one line, basically. It's just putting everything on its own line, right? So how do we actually make it so that it only puts stuff on one line? Um, so let's kind of uh, Google for that, right? I'm just gonna pull up Google real quick. Um, I'm gonna say uh, node uh, node.js uh, print uh, uh, print console on one line. Uh, printing on let's go Stack Overflow. Why not? Everyone's uh, favorite website. Maybe there's other websites in there. Uh, we scroll down a little bit. To the top answer over here. Wow, look at those upvotes. Uh, Process.standardout.write. Oh, interesting. All right, let's try it. Um, I have no idea what this is. Again, do not copy and paste, right? Just see if it works by actually typing out yourself. So I'm gonna do process dot, oh my gosh, dot std, is that what they said? Uh, std out, like that, uh, dot write. And then it looks like now I can put in my string. So now I'm actually gonna take this, this dot grid, this dot call right here and put it in there. So in theory, if um, this article is correct, um, if we run this, then it's actually going to print out on one screen or on one line, sorry, instead of uh, kind of on, on separate lines. So let's see if that's what happens. So I'm gonna clear my console here, run this one more time and okay, okay, that's not bad, right? Um, so that's pretty good. Look at that, look at those trees all like squished up together. That, that's awesome. Um, so not really what we want, 
but closer, I'd say, right? It's a bit more foresty looking with all these trees clumped up. Um, but it's a little bit wonky still because these are these should be on the next line kind of thing and these on the next line kind of thing. So how do we do that? Well, we want to uh, figure out after we kind of go through the first uh, like set, the first row, we actually want to print a new line. So I'm going to see if we can do that. So we can actually probably just do a console log. Uh, but right after this kind of loop finishes for the inner set of uh, the row, I'm going to see if I can do this again, but I'm going to process dot std out dot write. Uh, and a, a new line is like this. I could have probably also just done a console log, which actually is going to print a new line and just give it no an empty string or just no string at all. all right. So let's see what happens if we do this. And look at that. Awesome. So um, that actually is pretty good, right? Uh, if, we, if we look at this, this is, this is actually our grid, right? And now that's much better looking, right? So ju just to compare these two, um, that's much better looking than, than this right here, right? I don't know about you, uh, but I, I much prefer this one. It's a little bit tight. You can probably clean it up a little bit, um, but but it's definitely much better than with all these columns and quotes and all that kind of stuff going on, right? This feels much more game-like and much more realistic, right? Okay, perfect. So I, I'm gonna get rid of my little console log grid here. Um, and the next thing we want to do is figure out how we can maybe add a tiny bit of spacing here. So maybe, you know, maybe I can do like a plus, like a little, like a space here. Maybe that'll work. Like after each of these, I'm gonna put a little space, see, see, see what that gives us. Um, so if I do that, all right, all right, that's not too bad. Um, you know, maybe I can do like two spaces there we go. That's that's pretty good, right? Um, so what I'll show you is kind of a little trick that's pretty uh, pretty useful, um, and, and you can either do it like this, where you can concatenate it to the end, or you can just do it right after. So I'll just do it right after, just to show you an alternative. Uh, but you could just done this with concat as well. Um, instead of just adding a bunch of spaces like this, right? Um, what you can actually do is use the tab character. So instead of the new line character, you can do it backslash t. And what this does is it usually lines up. Um, different uh, characters on the string depending on how long they are, which is quite nice. So let's kind of compare this. So if I run this, all right, so there we go. That, that That's actually not bad. So they're equally spaced out, right? Arguably a bit too spaced out. So if you like this more, you like this less, really a preference thing. Um, I found that when I switched out different emojis, I actually had some small bugs appear when um, I used uh, spaces. So I actually just sticked to the tabs, uh, but it's really up to you. I'm just gonna stick the tabs since that's what I have in my notes, uh, but I'll leave it up to you to decide if that looks better or that looks worse. Um, but definitely, I uh, hopefully you agree, it looks better than our <laughs> array representation. Okay. Now, now we're getting somewhere, right? This is this is pretty good. Like we already have uh, our player technically on here. We have our goal. We have our little grid mapped out. Uh, but really, this is just a bunch of emojis on the screen, right? Um, so we need a way to to think about uh, different types of objects in our game. Right. So if you think about it, we really have quite a lot of objects um, already. Right. We actually have already three objects. If you think about it, we have our player here. Right. We have uh, kind of like our our little tree background objects. Right. Uh, and then we have our, our goal. Right. Uh, and, and in theory, we're going to have a few more types of objects. Right. Because if we look at our example, um, we eventually want to be able to, you know, fight a fight a monster or we want to, you know, find an item or we have these little like footprints showing up as we're kind of going across the map just like this. Right. So uh, we, we need a way to represent these different things as we kind of run into them uh, from as different kind of objects from each other. OK, um, so that's definitely one thing we need to think about. The, the other thing is that if you actually now even just looking at this, I'm realizing that, you know, this is a much nicer looking map than uh, the one that we have. If, if you look closely here, we have different trees, <laughs> a different different landscape. Right. Um, and it, it adds a little bit of flavor, a little bit of life to our, our map, especially since we're playing in the terminal. Um, let's see if we can kind of get that working for us before we jump into the, the objects. Right. So uh, let's let's kind of figure out what it is we can do to actually randomly generate this kind of tree background. Because I really, really like this. It looks, it looks quite nice. Uh, because, you know, as nice as these trees are, it'd be nice to have a bit of variety uh, so that it's a bit more engaging <laughs> for uh, for our player. So uh, what we could probably do is start to combine some of these together now, right? Um, well, in theory, you could probably say, okay, you know, 
what we could do over here is instead of pushing this tree, right, maybe we can just pick uh, one out of like a few different um, uh, like sprites and just push that on instead. Uh, but let's let's kind of try to uh, kind of do the whole two birds with one stone thing here, where we're actually going to build an object that it can figure out kind of what type of object it is for this grid. And we can actually just push that object directly onto the grid. And it's actually going to be rendered correctly as well once we update our display function. So that all sounds kind of crazy. So let's just get right to it and see what that might look like. So I'm actually going to create a new file and I'm going to call this the grid object.js. Okay. And the idea behind this is this is going to be a base object that I can kind of uh, have other objects like say the enemy or the item uh, actually rely on or be a subclasses of to be super technical about it. Right, so this is kind of the base class, and then we're going to have other subclasses based on this that share similar properties but have own customizations to them. Okay, so um, I'm going to create my class. I'm going to say that this is a grid object. Then I'm going to say, okay, well, I want some background sprites. So uh, just to be kind of fun here, I started introducing some private variables because I didn't want these to be accessible like in the subclasses or outside of this class. So, so kind of just to get a bit of practice with that, I created a background sprites array just like this and in here i put a few uh, of the sprites that i wanted to choose from so you can actually add as many as you want i'm just going to add uh, kind of a couple of different uh, varieties of trees in here so i'm going to say uh, there's that tree uh, and then i think i have like this little christmas looking tree um, and then i'm going to have a little palm tree and uh, you know what, I think I also had my cactus in there. So so why not we go with the cactus as well? Look at that. Beautiful. All right. So this is, uh, I was going to put on one line for me. Thank you, prettier. Um, <laughs> so uh, that's kind of our list of different things that we can choose from. So you can imagine that instead of, you know, rendering the same tree repeatedly, we can maybe, you know, have a 25% chance in this case, since there's four of them, of just choosing any random one of these which would be kind of nice just to add some diversity to our little forest here. So I'm going to create a constructor here. Um, and the way that I designed this is I said, this is going to take the sprite that we want because I want to be able to subclass this later. And I also gave this, oh my gosh, not a try catch, uh, a type. And the type I gave this, and, and you'll see why we were going to do this in a second, was undiscovered. Um, now you can, you can probably give this uh, any name. I don't even know if that's a real word or not. Um, but uh, I basically want to indicate that this is like a background. Right, I probably could have just said background now that I think about, it. but uh, I think the other one was discovered. So I just went with undiscovered, <laughs> um, meaning that we haven't seen this yet, right? Yeah, which kind of makes sense. Um, so uh, inside of here, what I want to kind of do is I want to say, well, if there's um, if there's no sprite given to us, right? So if sprite is undefined, so if we kind of just try to create a new grid object, but we don't give it a sprite, then we're gonna assume that we want kind of the default sprite or the default grid object, or that we're not kind of creating a subclass of this. Um, so uh, I'm gonna just say, if there's no sprite, and hopefully this makes sense as we actually start to use it, um, then I want to choose a sprite from here for um, the, you know, the caller of this function. So how do we choose a random uh, item from an array? Well, we need to generate a random index in this case between zero and three. Uh, and then we need to index into that background sprites uh, to actually grab one of those sprites out. So I'm going to say const uh, random index. This is going to be uh, math.floor, right, which uh, takes a decimal and chops it off basically and rounds it down uh, of math.random uh, multiplied by this dot background uh, dot length, just like that. <clears throat> okay, it's going to put on multiple lines just so it's a bit easier to read. So this is a pretty common thing to do. Eventually, you'll just get good at kind of, uh, you know, memorizing this. Uh, but effectively, this is going to generate a random number between zero and one. And this is going to be the length of our background sprites, which is four. And this is going to give us a number between zero and four, um, once you multiply all those numbers together. Um, then what we can do is uh, now we have an actual uh, random index and we can actually set that to be the sprite for this object. So we can say this dot sprite uh, is equal to um, this dot background sprites and we're gonna index into it using this random index that we just generated. Um, if we didn't, uh, if we did pass in a sprite, uh, we're gonna say this dot sprite is equal to that sprite. Okay, so if we, if we give it something that's um, 
that's an actual sprite, then, then we're going to do this. And if we give it undefined, basically, or don't give it any sprite at all, uh, we're going to actually pass one in from this list of sprites. Um, and then type, we're also going to assign, we're going to say this.type is equal to type. OK, uh, that's pretty good. Um, so yeah, there, there. now we have an actual uh, grid object. And we can actually see if um, you know we can generate this grid object for our grid. So I'm actually going to export this. Um, and as I'm doing my exports, what you'll also notice is that I tend to not do default exports. I try to name all my exports. Uh, I am generally not the biggest fan of default exports, uh, maybe just a preference thing. Uh, I like to kind of know exactly what's coming in uh, from the different files, especially if there's multiple exports. And this is kind of the easiest way to do that. So I'm just going to use a non-default export for all my exports. Um, however, we're in uh, Node.js, and I'm in a version of Node.js uh, like 16 or 17 that is not uh, ES modules by default. So I'm going to create a package.json file. Uh, so I'm going to just say uh, npm init dash y here. Uh, and it's going to create a package.json file for me. Um, and inside of this package JSON is a whole bunch of stuff in here. I'm going to add a type of module at the end. You can technically just create a package JSON that's empty and have this be the only thing in there as well. Uh, but if you do want to change any of this stuff for whatever reason and give it um, some extra scripts or a uh, different name or versioning as you go along, you can definitely do that in here as well. But the most important thing for us right now is type module to actually um, make it so that we can use ES modules, which is our important export format because by default, Node.js uses the common JS import export format, which is the module.exports um, and the require syntax, which is not what we want to use. OK, um, so now that I have that, I can actually import that in here. So I'm going to come to the very top. I'm going to say import from dot slash grid object dot JS. Uh, and then I should be able to grab that grid object. There we go. Right. So um, I got my grid object coming uh, from this local folders uh, grid object.js file. Right? That's pretty great. Um, now, what can we actually do with this grid object now? Well, the, the most important thing to probably do is actually just start seeing if it actually works to generate these random sprites. Okay? So let's see if we can do that. So I'm going to come up to, where is it? This dot push right here, this dot row or this row dot push. It's probably a confusing name. It shouldn't have this in it. Uh, because this means something else. So I should probably have just said uh, current row or something. Uh, but let's just go with this. Um, and instead of pushing a string, what I want to now do instead is push a grid object. So I'm going to say new grid object. And I'm going to pass it this string um, as the sprite. Um, but actually, if I do this, what we'll see is that our logic is going to kick in and we're actually just going to get this printed out. OK, so just to show you what this looks like, um, I'm going to leave it at this and we're going to change it to see what this changes for us. Um, I'm going to leave these to be the same for now um, and see an error pop up. Uh, and then down here in the display grid, what we need to do is actually make sure that we're looking at the sprite. So if you think about how this works, our object for our grid object has a type property and a sprite property. The sprite is the string that has the actual um, uh, like character, or, uh, like em emoji in this case, inside of it. So we don't actually want to write out um, the, the object directly. We want to grab the objects dot sprite, right? Uh, because that is the emoji on there now. It's because we're passing in an object. We're not passing in the string. So we have to grab the the sprite property. So if we do uh, this, oops, that's not what I want to do. Uh, I want to run uh, node grid.js. Uh, we're going to get an error, uh, which is going to say here somewhere uh, invalid arguments type uh, something something chunk received undefined. Um, so the the reason for this is that uh, this is kind of a tricky error to look at is because we're still using regular strings for these. So um, what I need to actually do is turn, turn these as well into grid objects because now we're trying to grab sprites off of um, our grid, grid objects, basically. So we're trying to basically grab dot sprite off of this, which actually is not going to work. So I'm going to say dot grid object for this new grid object, and I'm going to make it a monkey. And I'm going to say this is also equal to a new grid object. Uh, and this is equal to a uh, star. So um, 
really quick as well, as we're going through this, um, you can see that we can technically pass in a type here, right? Um, so I'm gonna change the type because this, 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 this grid object right here is definitely not undiscovered. This is the player. And, and this is, I don't know, maybe let's just say the win for now. We'll come back to this later. We're actually gonna use this to ch check our win condition, but the type of this grid object is gonna be win in this case, because that's what we set up for our grid object. Okay, let's try this again. See if we uh, get it working. And uh, there we go, right? That, that's not bad, look at this. So we have our actual um, array being printed out again, just like before, right? Literally nothing changed. Uh, but now the only difference is that we're using grid objects. Uh, and where uh, our display function is using the sprite property, which is the actual string, which is what we're being passed in right here, either here or here. So we're not actually executing line nine right now because we're actually passing in a sprite. So sprite is not undefined for any of these grid objects, but check this out. If I don't pass in this string right here and I just create a new grid object like this, I'm technically passing in undefined for both sprite and type. If I do that, I'm gonna trigger this if condition, which is going to set it to be the random index of the background sprites and the type is going to be undiscovered. So if I do that, let's see what happens. Check it out, right? Isn't that totally awesome? And if I run this multiple times, you can see that I'm actually going to get different kind of background layouts every single time because it's being randomized from that list of random background sprites. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. Um, I know that was definitely a lot. Um, so if you're kind of looking at that and being like, oh my gosh, that was just like really fast. There's just so much going on right here. Even just to print out a bunch of trees, this is just totally crazy. I get it, right? Um, that's kind of the point of this, right? The, eventually the goal is to be comfortable creating other objects to hold data and logic so that you don't have everything in one file or everything in one class or everything in one module. Right? Literally, the, the point of this exercise is to think in the context of different objects, how they interact with each other, and the different states and methods that they have uh, within them to actually do different types of logic. Okay, um, cool. So uh, that's pretty much um, our grid object. So th th we're making some good pro uh, progress, right? If you think about this, um, now we actually have two classes in our project. Um, we have our grid being laid out um, and we have a little bit of an abstraction on top of strings here where we can add more information uh, for our different objects that we have in our grid, right? Um, and we even have a way to print that out uh, as long as that thing has a sprite property, which it does because it is a grid object. Um, so the next thing that we probably want to do is uh, see if we can actually make our uh, player just move around, right? Like you, you probably could go to making an item and an enemy, uh, but really without our player actually moving around, it's going to be hard to actually test anything because the only way that we can actually encounter an enemy really or encounter an item is by moving around, um, at least according to our rules, right? So uh, we, we want to see if we can kind of, you know, move to the right, move up, move down, move left, see if that all works because there's definitely a bit of logic involved there as well. So let's see if we can kind of get that working. Um, so to start, um, I'm actually going to do this purely in code and I'm going to add the actual commands to do this later using Inquirer uh, because I wanna show you that you can technically test this without really actually having to go through the manual kind of up, down, left, right process, which makes it a little bit easier. Okay, so if we think about this, now movement, right? Movement, this is gonna be uh, a really core and important part of our game. So um, what do we need to figure out how movement works? Well, if you think about this as a grid, so like, let's say that this is uh, like, a, like a regular X, Y kind of coordinate grid, if you've seen that in mathematics, I'm gonna pretend, right? Uh, and you can kind of go with any arbitrary kind of coordinate system. But in, in my, you know, Natter's grid coordinate system for this adventure game, I'm going to say that I start at zero, zero, right? So this is like my or origin, basically. Um, and, and as I go to the right, my X increases. And as I go up, my Y increases, just like it would in a regular X and Y mathematical grid. Now, a lot of computer screens and games, for example, might work slightly differently. Sometimes zero, zero is in the top left. Sometimes it's in the bottom right. It really depends where the origin is. But if I... I'm making this game, 
I can just tell it that, you know, I, I expect the bottom left to be zero, zero, and all my logic is based on that fact. So if this is zero, zero, then if I move to the right by one, then now I'm at uh, x of one and y of zero, right? And then x of two and y of zero, and then x of two and y of one, right? So I'm keeping track basically of two coordinates, the x coordinate, which is the horizontal um, shifts, and then the y coordinates, which is the vertical shifts. Now, this is pretty common in pretty much most kind of game design and most game engines. Um, and if you can imagine if there's a three dimensional game, for example, you would need the extra dimension to keep track of, which would be the Z axis or the Z axis, um, which is kind of the depth axis, right? So you need to know how uh, kind of far in or out something is in the world that you're building. But since we're dealing with two dimensions, that makes our job a lot easier. So we only have to worry about the X and Y. And uh, really, it's only kind of uh, in this positive uh, direction. Um, OK, so uh, to, to simplify things here, what I'm going to do is to my constructor, I'm just going to store this information on the grid itself. Now, technically, we could store this in other places or we could create like a game that wraps the, the grid or we could store it on the player. I kind of just went the easy route and just shoved a lot of stuff into the grid uh, to keep some of the other classes a little bit kind of thinner and easier to understand. Uh, but um, by, by no means is the only solution or even the best solution, um, just kind of one possible solution. So uh, I'm going to say uh, player start x. Uh, I'm going to give this a default value of 0, as I just mentioned. I'm going to say player start y. Um, and I'm going to start this. And here is something really cool that you can do with JavaScript that we haven't covered before. In a default value for a function parameter, you can actually refer to the other parameters, which is super cool. So I can actually say the player start y is equal to the height minus one right here, because that's what this value is right here, right? Um, it's actually the height minus one. So if we give it a different height, um, we uh, are at uh, this spot. Actually, I just realized that as I'm doing this, uh, technically what I told you is wrong. Um, I actually meant to say that our uh, coordinate, our origin is over here. So I'm very sorry about that. I'm actually realizing that my logic is a little bit backwards. Um, I'm going to go with what I have in my notes um, because I didn't actually put it as zero, zero. I actually treated this as a regular computer screen, which is how most computer screens uh, treat things. Actually very in line with what HTML does on the web anyways. So actually might as well just go with that. Um, so I'm, I'm sorry that I messed that up. I'm getting kind of caught up with myself. Um, I will, let's pretend that this is zero, zero. Okay. So um, as we go uh, to the right, we're going up in X's. And then as we go down, we're going up in Y's. So there is no negative coordinates um, technically in our coordinate system. On the web, once we get to the DOM in the front end, there is negative coordinates, which would actually be in this direction, like upwards, if you think about it, or to the left. Uh, for the X. Um, but in our case, we can't actually go off the grid. Um, so we're, we don't have negative coordinates. So positive X is in this direction and positive Y is down in this direction. All right. So uh, if we kind of rephrase where our monkey is in this case, or our player, our player is at X of zero, but uh, of Y of height minus one. So if we think of our height in this case, if you think about uh, how we created this particular grid, it's five of five by five. Um, our height is five. So our height would be uh, five here, five minus one is four. So our coordinates would be zero comma four. So X of zero, Y of four. So X of zero is right here. Y of four is uh, zero, one, two, three, four, right? So we would go up uh, in, the, in the vertical direction, but in this case down um, by four to get to that spot. Okay, now the cool part here again is that we can dynamically refer to previous parameters as long as they come before uh, in future parameters, which is pretty pretty nifty little trick to um, to know for JavaScript. Um, okay, so uh, that's pretty good. So now we have a, a kind of a default value of the player start x and the player start y. So I'm actually going to assign those to the this. Uh, context as well. So I'm going to say this dot player, I'm just going to rename it here just so you can see how that might work. Uh, player start X and this dot player Y is equal to player start Y. So now I have access to these values on the this uh, object and in any of the other methods, which is pretty great. Um, and now what we can do is we can see if we can actually get movement working. Right. So uh, let, let's see if we can just start with moving to the right, because that is pretty much uh, what we want to start doing or more moving up technically. But let's just go with right. I don't know. Um, that's just what came to mind first. Um, so we'll, we'll just go with right to start. 
So I'm going to say, uh, let's create another method down here in our grid class. I'm going to say move player right. This is going to take no uh, arguments. So the parameter list is totally empty here. Um, and we want to figure out kind of how are we going to move our player to the right? Like, what does that actually mean in the context of kind of our coordinate system? So if we're at zero, four, or sorry, yeah, zero, four in this case, like mixing up uh, where we are in our grid, we want to move to the right. So that's going to be one and four, right? X of, um, X of uh, one and Y of four, right? Um, and if we move up, then we're going to be decreasing the Y coordinate. Okay, if we move to the right, we're increasing the x-coordinate. If we're moving to the left, we're decreasing the y-coordinate. And if we're moving uh, down, then we're increasing the y-coordinate. However, there are some uh, kind of constraints we need to be aware of. If we're at the edges, right, in this case, for example, now I'm hitting two edges. I'm hitting the left edge and I'm at the bottom edge. So technically, since our rules are we can't go off the map, I can't actually move to the left and I can't actually move down, right? So uh, if we think about when would moving to the right be an issue, well, moving to the right would be an issue if we're anywhere in this part of the grid, right? On the right-hand side, anything under this star line that we have, right? So if we're on the very right-hand side of our map, then if we tried to move to the right, then we would, by definition, be off of the map, which is not what we want to allow. So we actually want to stop the player and not allow them to actually move to the right and execute any logic like generating enemies or items or anything like that. We just want to say you're not allowed to do that, like choose another direction, right? So um, let's let's kind of account for that. So um, we want to say uh, check if uh, on right edge of map, right? That's what we want to do. So we're going to say if this dot player x so let's assume we're going to be changing the player x which is how we're keeping track of where our monkey is in this case on our map is equal to well is equal to what well we want to see if we're equal to the width of this grid but minus one since it's zero indexed so i'm going to say if this dot player x is equal to this dot width minus one then we know we're at the edge so i'm going to say console.log cannot move right I'll just go with something really simple. Uh, and then I'm actually going to return from this function so that it doesn't execute any code to try to move us to the right later. This is also called a guard. Okay, a lot of languages uh, come up with this new syntax, which is called like a guard. Like you can think of this as kind of standing guard at the start of our function and uh, checking for things that could go wrong so that when we get further into our function, uh, we don't get there uh, in cases where we know it's going to break. So in this case, we don't want to allow our player to go off the map. So we're just going to quit this function immediately and not execute anything else if they try to go to the right, if they're at the edge of the map. Okay. Now, if they pass this guard, right? So if uh, they are able to move to the right, basically. So for example, like at the start right here, if we are able to move here to this right spot, right? Or if we are able to move to this spot, well, what do we want to do? Well. If we think about our game uh, design here, uh, we're kind of trying to do this right here, where our monkey moves to the right, but then there's like some paw prints as to where we were previously. So we actually need to basically create a paw print object to put in the spot that we currently are at so that we can then move to the right and have that paw print there previously so that we um, can kind of keep track visually of actually what's happening on our map. So let's, uh, let's, let's kind of do that. I'm gonna say this, dot grid at where we are right now. So the spot that we are right now, again, is um, this, uh, in, in this case, if you think about it, the, the actual coordinate is a zero and four, right? Um, so the, the way that we actually want to uh, grab the location for this is this dot grid at this dot player uh, y and this dot player X, if I think about this, I'm pretty sure I got these a bit mixed up. Uh, player X, player Y, no, that's right, that's right. I think that's right. Um, I'm gonna come back to this. So my notes have this, is this right? We wanna do uh, this.grid at, yeah, 
actually this is this is this is why it gets really confusing with the uh if you don't name things rows and columns right um we actually want the this row zero one two three four we want the fourth row and the first item in that row so we're asking for the fourth row here and then the first item in that row i actually remember when i was coding this that i actually flipped these by accident because i didn't name them very well um so technically a better name would have been like uh, player like uh, row or something and, and player column uh, instead of this X and Y because that's not as clear as to what's happening. But I'll just go with this just so that we can see uh, kind of alternative methods that might get confusing. Hopefully it doesn't mess you up too badly. Um, so what we want to do at this spot though is we want to put down the pop prints before we actually move so that we have those pop prints there. So I'm going to say that this is a new grid object and I'm going to inside of here, uh, where are my pop prints? There's my pop prints. Um, and I'm going to say that um, I'm going to give this a type, right? If you if you recall, we, we can give our grid object a type. By default, it's un, uh, undiscovered, right? But now we can actually give it, and hopefully you can see now why I called it that, right? Uh, we can call it discovered, right? So now we can actually tell if we've seen something or not based on its type property, which is going to be pretty useful later. Um, then what we want to do is we actually want to move the player to the right, right? So I'm going to say this dot player X uh, plus equals one. Okay. Now keep in mind that when we're doing this uh, kind of calculation right here, and when we're doing this right here, we're, we're not displaying anything, right? We, this, this is only showing up because we're calling uh, our display grid function. So technically we can move stuff around and then display it later. Right, so that's what we're doing right here, just to be super, super clear. If we were to actually run this again, our player would not be moving at all. Um, if we were to call this function, which we haven't yet, it still wouldn't move, right? Because we um, have to actually uh, kind of re-render this grid uh, after we do this movement manually. So let's let's see kind of what that looks like in a second. Um, now, what we what what gets kind of tricky here is we wanna check to see if uh, the spot that we're moving to has already been discovered, okay? So if you think about how this might work, like let's say, uh, let's go back to our example here. Like let's say that we're in this scenario right now, like we've already moved to the right, right? Now, technically we can move in any direction, right? So if I move to the left now, now that's a valid move, right? I'm allowed to move to the left. It's just that I've been there before, right? But maybe I just want to like cut across the map, right? If you think about this scenario, maybe I'm too scared to go through this forest over here. I wanna kind of take it easy and go backtrack a little bit and then cut through, right? That should be totally allowed. Um, so we wanna make sure that if we backtrack, that that's treated slightly differently than if we were to explore an undiscovered region. Okay, so um, I'm gonna do that check right here. Uh, and actually this was a bug that came up as I was doing this program because I actually forgot to do this check and I was discovering things as I was backtracking, um, which doesn't really make sense. So um, I'm gonna say uh, if, so I'm gonna put a, a comment here. I'm just gonna say uh, set uh, our current spot to uh, be discovered. And then here we wanna check if where we are moving to has been discovered already, right? Um, and if this.grid at uh, this.player y, and what you'll notice is as we're doing this, there's a lot of repetition. So a lot of this is uh, kind of uh, really uh, good for probably making a function for, uh, but I, I just want you to have that back in your mind, right? Because we haven't actually, um, we're not really far enough yet to actually start refactoring some of these out into other functions. So we're going to ask if the current spot that we're at in the grid has been discovered. So if we're going to grab its type, so we're saying if the grid at this location, which is a grid object and its type is equal to uh, discovered, right? Then, then we know we've already been here before. Uh, so what I'm going to say is then I can actually just directly move my player. Uh, to that spot. So I'm going to say this.grid at this.player y and then at this.player x uh, is equal to a new, uh, I just generated a new grid object in this case every single time. Uh, technically, 
you can probably just keep one instance of this so you don't have to keep regenerating it but since i'm not um actually really doing anything other than visuals with this with the way that i have it set up it's totally fine to regenerate this because this is purely for visual representation um, if i was actually keeping track of statistics i wouldn't want to be regenerating the, the player object every time i'd be wanting to keep it in one place and just move the coordinates around um, and then i want to break out of this function okay uh, because if um if we hit this case and we've already discovered it well i don't want to continue right i've already moved uh, to that spot because that's what this is doing right here. This is actually moving. Uh, I should probably mention that this is uh, move the player to the right. Um, and then we can kind of quit because we've already moved to the right. So now if we re-render, uh, since we put a new object at that spot and we've also put the uh, paw prints at our previous spot, it would actually show correctly. Okay. Um, so that will only work in the case where we've seen that before. So in the case where we haven't seen it before, so now we are uh, discovering a new uh, new place, I guess, is, is the way to think about it. Um, so the, the way that I kind of uh, did this was I um, had a object that I had uh, in my uh, grid keep track of kind of what the current object actually is so i'm just going to set that up for now just so that we can actually see how that might work so i made it a private variable i called this current object and again this this is not something i came up with right away it took me a little while to come through this i'm just showing you kind of eventually what i landed at right so if you're just like how did you come up with this stuff um it, it definitely took a few uh tries and i as moved things around uh as it became more and more inefficient and refactored it and things like that right so uh, here I have a current object and I'm actually just gonna set it to be uh, null to start or undefined to start. Um, and uh, what I'm gonna do down here is I'm just gonna set it to be this dot current object is equal to a new uh, grid object. And when we discover this new kind of uh, space, what's, what's gonna happen is technically a couple of things can happen, right? Um, so what are the things that can happen technically in, in, in this, in moving to a new spot? So like in this case, we, we, we know that we can move to the right. We have moved the player to the right and we know that we've passed, uh, this check. So we, we, if, if we're down here, then by definition, that means we are not in a place that we've discovered before, which means that we're moving into a new terrain, right? So for example, right here. So what does this mean? So if I move to a new spot, well, there's basically three things that can happen. One is that nothing happens. And I just see that this is kind of like a, a chill clearing and, you know, I can relax and set up a campfire or whatever it is I want to do. Um, and let's say that that happens most of the time. But uh, something else that can happen is that technically, uh, I could run into an enemy, like say the spider, or I could run into an item, like say that sword. Okay. Um, so for now, let's just kind of placeholder this. And let's just say that this is where we're going to do some generation. Okay. And, and I'm just going to comment this out for now. Um, and then I'm going to say, I'm going to move the player to the spot. So I'm going to basically take this uh, code right here uh, and copy, uh, copy it over here. And this is the one place you can copy and paste. Okay. Um, now this might look a bit weird because it's like, well, you're basically doing the same thing here as here. Uh, but we'll see shortly that technically that there is a reason for this. And actually I probably should have extracted this into a function, uh, again, into a method, uh, but we'll get to that, uh, if we get to it later in the video. So now a lot of logic happening here, but let's kind of walk through this really quick before we actually try it out. If we are at the edge of the map on the right, we cannot move to the right. So we exit this function. And we tell the player that they can't move to the right. If we are not at the edge of the map, that means we can move to the right. So we can actually set our current spot to be uh, paw prints and discovered. And then we can move our X value to the right, which is plus by one. Um, if we've moved into a place that we've already discovered, so paw print, right? If, if, the, if the thing that we're moving to is also a paw print, which means we've been there before, well, we can just move there and nothing happens, right? And we exit this function. But if not, then we're, that means we're discovering a new place, right? And we want to generate a new object for that spot, which we haven't done yet. And then we can move our player there after that. Okay. Now, in theory, 
in this area here, this kind of innocuous little realm, uh, a lot of crazy stuff can happen, right? We could run into nothing and then we kind of move to the spot. We can run it into an enemy and we have to do the battle, uh, or we could run into an item and then we can collect that item and add it to our statistics. Okay, so quite a lot of stuff can happen into this small space. But let's just test to see if this actually works. Um, so if I kind of come up here into my um, constructor, what I can actually do is start to actually put in some uh, movement in here. Right. So let's say I display my grid at the start just like this. So I'm going to I'm going to kind of get rid of this console log here and uh, I'm going to say this dot move player right. OK, let, let's see what happens. So I'm going to I'm going to erase this and I'm going to rerun it one more time and nothing happened. Hmm. Now, you might remember that technically we're just moving numbers around in our grid in order for us to actually visualize that again. We need to re-render our grid. We need to re-execute our display grid function because that's the only thing that's actually showing where the current objects are. So after we've moved the player to the right, we've actually shifted stuff around in this grid, and then we can actually run our display grid function again to show us the updated version of that grid. So what we actually need to do is take this line right here, display grid, and put it here as well so that we can show the grid before, do the move, and then show the grid after. So let me run this and see, fingers crossed, if we can actually get our movement going. Oh my gosh, <laughs> look at that, right? It, it's actually kind of crammed together, right? Uh, because I should probably, I'm just gonna add a little bit here. Let's get a console.log of a, like a little bit of a line, uh, just just because this is just so worth it. This this moment right here is is quite, quite beautiful. Um, look at that, right? Look at it, it's so beautiful. So we have our grid and our monkeys in the bottom left, and then we moved our monkey to the right and we even have a paw print where our monkey was before, right? That's amazing. So check it out. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna you know, move to the right a whole bunch of times. Let's see what happens. I'm gonna run this one more time. Oh my gosh, amazing, amazing. So I'm actually gonna try to move to the right even more times. Let's see if we, our, our logic kicks in so that we don't actually go off the map, right? There we go. So we cannot move right, cannot move right, right? So there we go, it's working, it's working, right? That's super, super awesome. So let's uh, take that and keep going with this and actually add these other directions now, right? So we, we have this working with right, which we saw, which is just super amazing, right? So we're actually going, 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 going all the way to the right. Um, in theory, we should be able to get the other uh, directions working, right? Because uh, if right works, we can probably get up, down, left, uh, up, uh, down, and left working. <laughs> um, so I just want to mention here before we actually go into this, and I'm going to say this a couple times throughout the, the video, um, the the way that we're going to approach this is, is kind of quick and dirty with a little bit of refactoring and some kind of uh, best practices as much as we can. However, this code that we're going to write where we're going to be doing uh, the, the movement, right, uh, left, right, up and down, um, I'm actually just going to duplicate these functions, right, uh, which is not best practice because a lot of the code is going to remain the same from from those methods. Um, and the reason for this is just a simpler, easier to kind of for our brains to reason with what we can do later is take this code um, and actually like refactor it into something uh, much easier to understand. Maybe we can actually make it into one method that kind of does all four directions, right? So uh, let's go ahead and just kind of copy this uh, entire method, right? Move player uh, right. And I'm going to paste it. Again, not best practice, right? As soon as you notice yourself copying and pasting pretty much anything, something is probably wrong, um, but that's fine. Uh, for now, that's fine. Um, let's see what we need to do. So um, to move the player to the left, um, which is this way, right, uh, to, to the left, um, the opposite kind of is true, right? We we, we want to check if the player is already at the very left. So instead of checking if they're at the very end of the array, we want to check if they're at index zero of the array. So that means that they can't move uh, left anymore because they're at the left edge uh, of the map, right? So that's going to change, which kind of makes sense. Um, then we want to set uh, our place to be discovered if we've uh, walked over it. And then instead of moving the player to the right here, we want to move the player to the left to update our comments. And to do that, we're going to go minus equals one, which is in the in the left direction, right? So um, we're going to go plus to go this way and minus to go this way. So uh, that should kind of get that working. 
and then the rest of this is pretty much the same. So that that's a really good indication that you know this is probably not great code because we're duplicating too much. But hey, it's gonna work quick and dirty. Let's just get this out working to see if we can actually get our player moving to the left, up and down. So um, let's just copy this code here. Uh, move player to the right. Then I'm gonna do this uh, dot uh, move player left. Let, let me do that a couple of times, like I don't know, like four times or something. Um, and I'm gonna rerun this and fingers crossed, let's see if this works. And there we go, right? So we ended up back at the beginning. And if I add a couple more here, uh, we're gonna see that uh, we, we can't really move to the left anymore. And I'm a bit off the screen there, but hopefully you see those print messages. So um, that's working pretty well. So let's do up and down as well, right? So while we're at it, we'll do, we'll do up and down. Um, so to do up and down, I'm just gonna kind of copy this again. Um, and I'm gonna paste it down here. Um, and this one's gonna be move player uh, up. So this is where things just change ever so slightly, right? So um, up and down are, are different in the sense that they're gonna be dealing with the Y direction, right? So in this case, instead of checking to see uh, if we're at the left of the map, you wanna check if we're at the, uh, the up, up edge of the map, the upper edge, I guess, sorry, what is this? Upper edge. Um, and in order to do this, we wanna see if player Y uh, is equal to zero. Now these coordinates are a bit uh, kind of messy because of the way I have set it up now in retrospect, but I'll just leave it like this so I don't get confused by notes. Hopefully you can follow along and that makes sense. So if we're at the very top, uh, we don't wanna move any higher according to our coordinate system. Uh, we wanna say that you cannot move up. Um, and then the only thing here that's changing is this dot player Y here. Uh, if we can move to move up, quote unquote, uh, you're gonna be going up this coordinate system, which is minus equals one, because we said zero is towards the top, right? So uh, up is going, uh, plus is going uh, down, and then uh, up is going minus, which is up. Uh, but that was a really confusing sentence, uh, but, <laughs> but hopefully that makes sense. Um, great, and now, uh, now let's just go add down, and then we can actually test out all these functions, because I have a feeling that these are gonna work just fine. So we're gonna say uh, move player down, and then this one is slightly different, right? Because uh, now we want to do the same thing, uh, but the reverse of the uh, going to the right. Uh, so we want to check if we're on the uh, the bottom edge. Um, and in order to do that, that's going to be uh, this dot player y is uh, equal to this dot uh, height uh, minus one. Uh, then we're going to say we cannot move down any further because we're already at the bottom edge, right? And the only difference here, as we just mentioned, is to go down if you do get past that point. So if you're not on the bottom edge, then in order to go down, you can do a uh, plus equals one and everything else remains the same. So again, it really important to notice, this is not great code. Like to, to be completely frank, this is pretty awful. Um, this is different for each of these methods. Um, this is kind of the same, right? This is the same, this is different. But definitely the rest of this right now, at least, is the same, right? And whenever you see stuff like this, this is a great candidate for being like, okay, how can I kind of, maybe later, not right now, once we get it working, right? How can I kind of take this and make it a bit neater and easier to use so that if I want to change something, I don't have to like change it in four places. So you're going to see as we're going to go with this method, the drawbacks to having kind of this repeat code, right? Is we're going to have to do things in four places and there's room for bugs, room for errors. And it's it's just it's just not a good experience to have to repeat things a whole bunch of times, right? Um, if we add stuff, we have to add it in four places in this case. Remove functionality, which remove it in four places, which is which is not ideal. But it, again, we'll leave it for now, just so that we can kind of move ahead <laughs> with our lives and uh, see if this actually works. So um, let's let's see if this works. So I'm gonna, I'm going to do move player right. Uh, then I'm going to say uh, you know this dot move player uh, up, and you know what? Let's go up twice. Why not? Uh, and then we'll do left twice. Uh, actually, you know what? Let's go up. Let's go up three times or four times. Why not? And then uh, we'll go left twice. And then I'm gonna do uh, this dot move player down. Let's see what we get. Um, and then sure, move left twice again. Why not? You know, let, uh, the world is our oyster. Let's see if this works. So fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I mean, <laughs> not really okay. Uh, because actually, if you see what happened, we kind of we hit the goal, but nothing happened. We didn't actually win. Um, so that's problematic. We got to fix that. Uh, but the pathing actually works, right? So if you if you follow this flow. Right? This, this actually works pretty well. So we're, we're going all the way right, then we're going up and then left and down and left, which is pretty darn awesome, right? Like that just looks quite beautiful. I don't know about you, but I could probably sit here and kind of make these little paths um, and really enjoy myself even with just this without it be, being a, a game yet. Um, but yeah, okay, great. So uh, it would be nice um, if, <clears throat> if we go back to our 
uh, kind of a player uh, screen here, but our kind of optimal result. Th th there's a few different things happening, right? What, what you'll notice is that actually right here, when, when we move around, we get like this nice little, uh, like the surroundings look familiar. Right, so we get some text being logged out when we when we reach a new spot, which is kind of which is kind of nice, right? Um, so how do we do this? Um, we want to make it so that when you jump onto a new square, if that square ends up being uh, like like not a monster or not a item, then we can actually do this like coast is clear or something like that, right? So how do we actually go about that? Well, if we think about this, like let, let's come down to one of our uh, methods here. So if we see that a spot has been discovered already, which means that if we move to this spot um, and we, we, we're putting the paw prints on that spot and then we're, we're, we're moving there. Uh, what we really need to eventually do is figure out a way to actually generate kind of one of those three possibilities. We need to figure out, are we hitting an enemy? Are we hitting a um, item or are we actually just kind of in, in a new spot? So the new spot can actually happen in two ways if you really think about it. Because technically we can actually backtrack through these spots as well, right? So if I move my monkey here, to the right, um, what should happen is I shouldn't actually have to encounter an enemy or an item, right? So it's a safe kind of move, in this case, to move to the right because I've already discovered it, right? So if I want to like, say, discover, uh, like, let's say like this tree right here, right? Well, I, I could go down and then go across this way, but then my chances of encountering, you know, that, that spider or something is, is much higher than if I just go all the way this way, right? And then try to explore the spot because I know I'm not going to encounter anything dangerous along this way, but I'm also not going to encounter anything useful like a sword, for example, right? Um, so we need to make it safe uh, for our players to move back along their paw prints um, and actually kind of give them uh, like a safe feeling. Like the coast is clear, right? Or something like that. Like we have some flavor text usually. So how do we go about that? So let's kind of start that process uh, before we go a bit further with creating different objects as well. So in our grid object, I'm going to come back in here. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to add this describe. Okay. And this function is going to just log out uh, like coast is clear for now. Okay, so I can do console.log, I'm gonna say coast is clear, for example, right? And what I wanna do is every time I hit one of these grid obje uh, objects that's marked as discovered, I wanna just log this out, right? So when does that happen? And this is gonna come to the annoying part of we're gonna have to change this in four places, but when we hit a, a discovered tile or a discovered grid object, we want to uh, describe it. We want to say that, hey, this has been uh, cleared, right? So how do we do that? Well, we're going to say this dot grid at this, oh my gosh, not touch list, uh, at this dot player uh, y, sorry, uh, and then this dot player x, which is where we are currently standing, um, dot describe. Right? So if the spot that we moved to, right, for example, to the right here, if the spot that we moved to is a paw print, then we want to describe it, which is going to actually come to the grid object and describe it using this method, which is coast is clear. Okay, so I'm going to copy this line and put it into all four of our, uh, of our functions here. So right here is one. And this is the problem with having so many functions. Technically, we should only have to do this one time if we designed our methods well. But hey, that's what it is. Uh, this is a good example of why that is the case. Um, let's see uh, what happens if I try to move my player uh, to the right. So we see that we're here, right? Now, if I move to the right two times, I should see coast is clear two times, right? So I'm just going to grab this uh, move to the right. I'm going to put it down here twice. Um, and what we should see is coast is clear, log out two times, right? Because uh, we're, we're trying to move back across two paw prints. So I'm going to clear my console here, run it, and there we go, right? Like, that's pretty awesome. So we get our coast is clear logged out. Uh, that's pretty wonderful. Um, so everything's going good there. 
Um, now, eventually, it'd be really nice to actually have this log out something uh, different. Uh, every single time that we move across these tiles, something different should technically log out. Like, if you imagine if you just we went up and then right and then like down and all that kind of stuff. Um, and every single time, just coast is clear, coast is clear, coast is clear. That would get really boring really fast. I'm sure you've played games where there's like a little bit of variation in the text that they use, right? Um, so how do we actually go about that? And, and this is going to kind of open up a, a new area for us to explore when we're actually coding the, out this app, which is like slowly moving towards like the idea of generating randomness when it comes to actually encounters. So let's work through that really quick together. So what I want to do in my grid object is I want to make it so uh, to start, at least I have three different possibilities. Okay, so so check this out. I'm going to go through this um, a bit slowly, just so it makes sense, because it's so central to kind of this idea of randomness. So I'm going to actually create a random number here. Uh, this is going to be math.random. And remember, this is a random number between zero and one. Okay, so if I do this, if I say if this random number is less than 0 0.33, for example, just like this. Um, and then I say console log coast is clear. What this is effectively saying is 30, like one third of the time, right? One out of every three times approximately on average, uh, I want you to log coast is clear and then the other times do nothing. That's basically what this function is doing, right? If you really think about it, because this is a random number between zero and one, this is always going to happen one third of the time if we're checking for something between uh, 0 and 0 0.33. Now, what we can do is we can use this fact to, to, to kind of expand on, right? So I can say else if this random number, and this is where the else if really uh, helps a little bit. So we can do different ifs if we check for two conditions or just use this else if case to kind of short circuit that. Um, if it's between 0.33 and 0.66, which is another 0.33, um, that's going to happen another one third of the time, right? So in here, I can say like console.log, for example, and I think I had like these surroundings uh, look familiar, <laughs> right? something like that. And in every other case, which is again, another one third of the time, right? So this is going to execute one third of the time. This is going to execute one third of the time. And then the else is going to happen the other one third of the time, which is equal to 100%, right, in total. Um, then I'm going to do a, another console log, which is one of my other flavor texts. For example, um, let's just say that uh, there's uh, not much here, for example. All right. So, so just so I have some variety. So to really test this out, we can actually just come right back in here and we can uh, let, let, let's move up after this. So I'm going to move up and then I'm going to move right and move right again. And let's see kind of what we get. And I know we have just a lot of ridiculous movement uh, going on here. And I, I don't know why you would really do this in this real game right now, this way particularly, but it's useful to test our code. Um, so check that out, right? We actually got all three of them. Um, so that's pretty good. So we got um, not much here, not much here. Coast is clear, surroundings look familiar. So hopefully you can see, right, in like in a, in, in a regular game, uh, you know, this might happen. Uh, you, you might have the player really try to backtrace quite a bit. And it, it definitely is a bit more engaging and a bit more fun to have uh, this kind of randomness happen. It feels, it feels more natural, right? It, it's definitely a, a big part of game design. Um, and this idea of generating a random number and then having things happen depending on where that range is, is actually pretty central to things like spawning and uh, item encounter chances and um, even just stat chances and like anything you having to do with like a stat generation and all that kind of fun stuff, right? So a, a lot of really cool stuff we can do um, with this simple idea of just checking something between different ranges with a random number. Okay, so that's pretty fun. So let's let's keep going with this. So now that we have movement working, um, we need to figure out how to actually get something to spawn as we're moving around this map, right? So um, for example, if we start over here, right? Like, like, like we're starting over here. If I move to the right, now three things can happen as we've mentioned. Since it's a new tile, we've never explored it before, we should either be able to see an enemy, an item, or nothing. And we can tune those ratios and percentages depending on how hard or easy or diverse we want to make our game, right? Um, so we kind of have to make these objects 
in order to actually put them in the game. So th this next part is going to get kind of gnarly because we're going to jump right into making a bunch of classes together that extend our grid object. And then we're going to start putting them into the game to see if they actually work. So this next part is going to be like code, 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 code together, um, just so we get really, really comfortable with these OOP concepts, uh, specifically things like polymorphism and subclassing um, with from the superclass of grid object, um, and then overriding the methods and all that kind of stuff. Okay, so so let's let's go into this. And and again, I really want to mention before we actually code this, um, there's like probably no way that you would come up with this right away. It's, it's very unlikely. Uh, it's going to take a lot of iteration to arrive to this point. What you're seeing me code out is kind of like my design that I ended up with after kind of trying to think about this for a little while and playing around with it and actually switching some things around and making new objects, right? So uh, if, if you're just like, how the heck would you come up with this right away? Uh, you probably wouldn't, right? Uh, at least not until you do this a bunch of times. Uh, it probably is going to take quite a long time to come up with a design like this. And the more objects you have, definitely, um, it's, it's usually a bit easier to figure things out, um, as you'll see, because we can split up the logic among different things like we would in real life anyways. And that's kind of one of the central premises of OOP. So I'm going to come over here. I'm going to create a new file. I'm going to call this item object .js. OK, so here I'm going to do a class. This is going to be item object, and we're going to extend our grid object. So we need to actually uh, import that. So I'm going to say import uh, grid object from dot slash grid object dot JS. So from the current folder, just like we did in our grid at the very, very top, we imported the grid object. Uh, I'm going to do the same over here. So we're going to say imports grid object or extends, <laughs> extends grid object uh, after we import it. Uh, okay. So uh, what do we want our item to do? Well, we'll just start. Let's just start with a constructor. Okay. So every, every, uh, like subclass in theory should have constructor. If we're going to be overriding it, um, we have to call super and all that kind of stuff. So what do we want in here? I want to show you something interesting. Technically, what you can do is you can actually have a slightly different method signature for the constructor in a subclass than what the parent class has, right? Because really it's its own function. So I'm actually going to change how I construct this, uh, compared to what I have here in the parent, right? So here I have a sprite and a type. In item object, what I'm going to do is I'm going to have a sprite and a stats. And you'll see why in a second. And this is very useful to know. So the first thing we need to do is we always have to call super. I'm going to pass it the sprite. I'm just going to leave the type as uh, undefined. Uh, and it's going to give it the default of undiscovered. Um, this is going to set up the uh, this object as well as a prototype chain and all that fun stuff for us. We can't actually access the, this object or do anything really in this constructor uh, without calling super first. Um, OK, so then what I want to do is I want to say this dot type. Uh, I'm going to change it because the super is going to make it undiscovered uh, as we see right here. Right. Uh, super is going to make it undiscovered. If I don't pass it in, uh, I'm going to override it and make it item. So this is effectively like our tagging system. A lot of game engines have this built in where you can tag different objects with different tags like this, like an item or a player or an enemy or a background or whatever. Um, and it, you can do different things depending on the tag for the item. And we're going to use this for polymorphism uh, and a couple of other things uh, later on, which we'll see pretty soon. Um, I guess actually technically this is not polymorphism. We're actually going to use this to discover that it is a item object um, and do something useful with that. Technically, what we could do is you could actually use instance of to detect an item object. Uh, but this is definitely a bit nicer to actually use, which we'll see when we actually get to it. So if that's all kind of confusing, um, I apologize. We'll, we'll see that shortly. Um, what I want to do, though, inside the item object is I want to create a private stats uh, field. And I'm, I'm going to have every item object have the stats field. And it's going to have a name. I'll just start it as null. Um, it's going to have an attack. Uh, I'll start at zero. Going to have a defense. Uh, I'll start that at zero as well, and an HP, which I'll also start at zero. Okay. Then what I want to do is actually set this dot stats to be the the stats. So I'm going to say this dot hashtag stats, which is our private stats, is equal to the stats that get passed in. So the person calling our item object constructor needs to know that they're going to pass in something of this shape. Right, something that has a name, attack, defense, and HP in order to construct an item object. Now, for this small app, 
uh, small quote unquote, <laughs> um, that's fine. Uh, eventually we'd wanna use strategies to make it a bit easier to know what we're actually passing in, um, but this is totally fine to get this started. Now, here are a couple of fun things we can do to get practice with writing methods inside of classes to really make this more useful than just a simple function. So uh, I want to create uh, a method here. I'm going to call this item name. Uh, I think this is uh, probably from our older version. I probably should have said get name, but we'll go with this for now. I'm going to say return this dot stats dot name so we can get the name of this object if we need it. Uh, then we're going to do a get stats. So where things get kind of interesting. Um, I want to kind of make this a little bit more functional. I'm mixing a bit of functional and OOP here um, where I don't actually want to give anyone direct access to the stats object because what happens if, if, if I do this, if I say return uh, this dot stats, I'm actually returning a reference to this stats object. So if someone changes it, it's going to permanently change it right away for everything that's referring to this item in the entire game. Um, now, sometimes that might be what we want, um, but other times that might be a little bit uh, bug inducing. So what I want to do instead is I'm actually going to return a copy of the stats uh, so that we don't accidentally change the stats. And if we do want to change the stats, we're going to create a method to do that. And we'll see that with the player later. So I'm going to just copy all these stats over. I'm going to say the attack is this dot, uh, stats dot attack. I'm going to ignore the name since we have an item name already. Um, I'm going to say defense is going to be this dot stats dot defense. Uh, and then uh, HP is this dot stats dot HP. Now we're going to follow this trend for pretty much all of these. Um, and what we're also going to do is add a describe method, because what you probably noticed is not only do we see kind of this flavor text pop up when we actually uh, moving around the map, but when we find an item like the sword in this case, right? We actually see this text, right? The emoji, and then you found a sword. So we need a way to describe that to the player so they know what they're running into and what they're getting. So let's go ahead and do that. So I'm going to create a describe. And this is where polymorphism is going to come into play, right? Because we have a describe on the parent, but technically all of the extensions, in this case, the uh, enemy and the item, we haven't made the enemy yet, um, is going to have a describe and they're going to do it their own description. Okay, so I'm just going to grab stats here as a, uh, as a kind of simpler reference. So I don't have to keep saying this dot stats all the time. I'm going to say console.log and I'm going to say uh, this dot sprite. So I'm going to log the sprite first, right? So that's right here. I'm going to log the sprite and then a space and then you found a and then stats dot name. Right? So we're going to say uh, what the name of this is. So when we, when we actually create our object, you'll see what this actually looks like in the constructor. Um, then we want to say, uh, I'll put an estimation as well here, just so it's super exciting, um, console.log. Uh, and in here, I'll do another one and I'll say uh, stats.name uh, stats. And that is this line right here. Uh, this line right here, swords, stats, and then the HP attack and defense. So we want to code that out. So I'm going to say uh, HP and then placeholder uh, attack and then a placeholder and then defense and then uh, the placeholder here. So uh, for this one, we're going to say uh, stats dot HP, uh, stats dot attack and stats dot defense, as you can imagine. It's going to go off the screen a little bit, bring it back on stats dot defense. There we go. So uh, that's this log right here, just logging out that entire string and a template string. Perfect. So that's actually it, uh, at least for this class. That's that's pretty much it, right? So we're just going to export this item object so we can use it in our other files, and then we're pretty good. So let's do that. So I'm going to say export. I'm going to use the uh, named export, not the default export, just uh, for preference thing. And there you have it. There is our item. Okay, so uh, we're just gonna keep going with this before we actually see kind of the results of this, just to kind of get our fingers uh, in the like repetitive warmed up mode, uh, because we're, the nice thing is you're gonna actually start to see these patterns with all these different objects and kind of the way that they're structured. So the next one I wanna make is an enemy object. And um, I always spell this wrong, <laughs> enemy uh, object.js. Okay, so for our enemy object, it's actually going to be very similar. It's going to extend our grid object because it's going to appear as one of the tiles um, and it's going to uh, have very similar methods, which we'll see in a second. So I'm going to import that grid object just so that we can uh, use it over here. 
and this is going to be grid object.js. We always have to have the extension for ES modules. Um, so I'm going to say class uh, enemy object object <laughs> object uh, extends our grid object. There we go. And um, I'm going to create our constructor. And same thing in here. Okay, I'm actually going to copy a very similar to the item object. I'm going to say this is going to take a sprite and this is going to take stats. First thing we need to do is call super, which is our grid object, as you can see here, VS Code hinting me. I'm going to pass it the sprite and it's going to set um, the type to undiscovered, right? Uh, and then after that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say this dot type, I'm going to tag it with enemy this time, right? Not item because it's an enemy object. So I'm going to give it a tag of enemy. Uh, and I'm going to create a stats here as well for enemy private stats. Uh, and this is going to be an object. Same thing. It's going to have a name uh, of null, uh, an attack of a zero, a defense of zero, and a HP of zero, which we're going to change when we actually construct this object. Then I'm going to say this dot stats is equal to the stats. All right, perfect. Then what we want to do is create the, the name getter. So I'm going to say get name. I think this is slightly different from our item, but that's OK. Um, and I'm going to say return this dot stats dot name. Since since this is just a string, it's already a copy anyway, so we don't have to worry about passing the reference. Uh, it's just the object that we need to worry about. So in this case, uh, I'm going to say get uh, stats as our next method. Um, and this is going to return the copy of our stats instead of stats directly. Um, and it's only going to return the attack, defense, and uh, HP. It's going to ignore the name because that's going to be in the other uh, method. So I'm going to say this dot stats dot attack. Uh, defense uh, is equal to this dot stats uh, stats dot defense. And uh, HP is equal to this dot stats dot HP. Perfect. There we go. Um, and finally, we're going to have a describe as well, because when we hit an enemy, as we saw before, uh, we're going to see this kind of thing, like you encountered a spider, right? So instead of you found a sword, you encountered a spider, and we're also going to print out the stats just like with the sword. Uh, the extra difference uh, is that we're going to need to kind of have this fight kind of play out, but we're going to deal with that later. For now, we're just going to stick with um, these methods. So I'm going to create my describe. Um, and in here, I'm going to say const stats uh, is equal to this dot stats, just so I have a shorter way to refer to stats. Uh, I'm going to console dot log. Um, and in here, I'm going to say this dot, oops, thus, this, oh my gosh, this sprite. Um, I'm going to say you encountered uh, a and then stats dot name. That is the wrong bracket. There we go. Uh, and I'll put an exclamation to make it extra exciting, just like before. Uh, and I'll do a console log. And in here, I'm going to do the whole uh, shebang about the stats.name. Uh, their stats is going to be HP, uh, and then template, and then attack, and then template, uh, and then defense, and then the template. So in here, I'm going to say uh, stats.hp and stats.attack. And in here, I'm going to say stats dot defense. Perfect. There we go. So just like we had for our item. Perfect. So uh, now our enemy object and our item object are very similar, right? Which kind of makes sense because they extend the grid object and they have um, this describe function. They have get stats, uh, get name, uh, as well as these custom stats for each of them because they need to actually know something about themselves that's different from the grid object. So let's kind of review that part because I think it's super important. The regular grid object doesn't really need stats. Maybe it does, right? But it really doesn't actually need stats. It's only the items and the enemies that need stats because they're the things that actually can change and have different types of stats. And some are stronger and some are weaker and we can find special items, right? Um, now, arguably, we could probably make like uh, a super class for enemy right? and extend on enemy and make all types of enemies. So it really is a design choice at some point. Uh, you just have to kind of land with one and uh, based on the game and, and just kind of go with it and uh, hopefully not too many changes over time. Usually you'll do the game design up front and you'll kind of uh, figure out the objects that you need and, and then build it based on that, right? 
Um, so in this case, it's, it's relatively simple. Uh, so we only have really one enemy in this game. Uh, we could actually do this with a few different enemies, uh, but to, to keep it really simple, we're just gonna do it with just this one enemy object. Um, and each of them needs to have stats, and that means our player also needs to have stats because we need to figure out how we can actually pick up items and add them to our stats, as well as fight the enemies and see if we're actually stronger or weaker than the enemy, right? Which is different than a regular background object because they have no stats because we're just walking over the terrain, for example, or the map. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. Okay, so uh, let's see what to do next. So uh, speaking of the player, I guess, um, actually I'll come in here and I'll export my enemy object real quick at the bottom. So I'll say export uh, enemy object just at the bottom here so that we can access it in our other files. The, the next nice thing to do uh, would be to actually have our player. Uh, and we're gonna see that this is actually gonna be very similar to, uh, in some respects to these files as well. So I'm gonna create another file, I'm gonna call this player.js. Now, the player is really going to be like a encapsulated stats uh, thing that's gonna exist to put all of our stats in for our player, okay? Uh, we're, we're gonna keep track and the state of the player over time. We're gonna see if they have uh, how much HP they have, how much attack they have, how much defense they have. Um, and we're gonna use that to see if we lose, if we win, if we can fight enemies and what kind of items we picked up along the way. Now, there's many ways to design this again. I have to keep emphasizing that, right? We could probably also keep track of the coordinates and all these other things inside of the player if we wanted to. Um, I just did a relatively quick and dirty uh, method to get this working with different types of classes so we can experience different um, logic. But really you can design this in almost an infinite amount of ways. And I also have my notes with me. So watching me code this obviously is much faster than you would actually do this yourself uh, because you obviously don't have the answer. So um, let's go ahead and make this class player. Uh, this is not gonna extend our grid object because this player is just gonna hold these stats as well as be responsible for um, like changing the stats, um, which we'll see in a second. So we're gonna create a constructor here. Our player is gonna have a name and stats. And we're gonna say this.name, there's no super, right? Cause we're not extending from anything. This.name is equal to name. And I'm gonna create a private stats object again. Uh, and this is gonna equal to uh, an attack here. Where, uh, since name is on the this object, I'm just gonna put the attack defense and strength, uh, <laughs> attack defense and HP uh, on the stats. Uh, defense uh, and HP at zero, there we go. Um, and I'm gonna say this this dot stats, this dot stats is equal to stats, perfect. And uh, now I wanna create my get stats, so let's do that. Uh, get stats. And inside of here, we're gonna say return uh, an object and we're gonna say uh, attack is uh, the copy, right? Attack is equal to this dot stats dot attack. Uh, defense, uh, not default, defense uh, is equal to this dot stats dot defense. Uh, and uh, HP is equal to this dot stats dot HP. So hopefully that is pretty clear from earlier. I, I realized we should probably do our name as well, just in case we use this. So we're gonna say get name. Um, and this is gonna return uh, this dot name because it's not actually in our stats. So there we go. Um, and now one difference from before we do describe from our um, other objects is that this player, if we think about the player, um, actually let's even come back here, right? Take this example right here of the sword, right? I know this is a bit small, so we're gonna see this a bit bigger when we actually code it. But if in this case, my player has uh, 20 attack, uh, 10 defense or 10, uh, sorry, 10, 10, <laughs> 20 HP, 10 attack, and five defense. I don't know why that was so hard for me to say. I was trying to subtract this in my head. Um, if we pick up the sword, then we end up with these stats, right? So that's basically what this is saying. Like we, we had some lower stats and then we added three attack and one defense and we ended up with these stats, right? So we need a way to change the player's stats. Now, you know, that, that probably opens up the question of, do we need a way to change the item stats? or change the enemy stats? And that's a fantastic question, right? Because maybe it does, right? You can think of an item object, you know, when would it make sense to change an item object stats? Well, you know, maybe it's like a, a special item or like a legendary item or something, or it's got uh, an enchantment on it or something, right? Or we uh, like, we refine it or something like that, right? Like a lot of games have these systems 
and we can take the base stats of the item and we can kind of add to it uh, so that it's, it's a little bit stronger uh, or it's changed in some way or has some special ability or whatever uh, than it normally would, right? So in that case, we would want to be able to change item. And you can imagine for the enemy, it'd be the same thing, right? We could we could maybe have an, a base enemy and then uh, we could make it so that like, like for example, a base spider, right? Uh, and then maybe we'll have like a strong spider, <laughs> right? <laughs> like a tarantula. Um, if you don't like spiders, I'm sorry. Uh, actually, spiders really scare me as well. Um, but yeah, uh, hopefully the, the emojis aren't too scary, hopefully. Um, but if we, if we ran like a strong spider, right? Maybe maybe it's a, maybe it has like a special ability, right? Like a, like an extra, uh, like a, maybe, maybe it's like a, like a vampiric bite or something. I'm just making stuff up, right? Where it's, it's got some life steal, steal some health from you and it adds it to itself or something, right? Like that would be an example of where we'd want to change uh, the actual enemy object stats. But in our game, we're going to keep it really simple the loop for a fight is actually just kind of a uh, like a direct battle in a loop literally between the player and the enemy until one runs out of health um and the mechanics are really who has basically more attack and defense and hp right so uh, we're, we're going to leave that out and we're just going to leave it so that the player is the only one that can change stats in this case just because it's already quite complex uh in order to actually get things like um the enemy to damage us because our hp has to go down uh, and then also to pick up items, which means that our attack, uh, HP, and uh, what's the other one? Defense uh, might change, right? So let's let, let's code that function out. So I'm going to say add to stats. Uh, that's going to be our uh, our method in order to manipulate the player's stats. So change the actual player stats. And I'm going to give this a stats object. Okay. And in this stats object, well, I want to check what's in the stats object, right? Because we can change the attack, defense, and HP. So I want to first check, is there a uh, attack? So if this has an attack, then I want to say this dot stats dot attack is going to get changed by this looks like go up by, but technically if we give this uh, method a negative number, this is actually going to make it go down. Right, so if I give this like a negative five, then my attacks can go down by five. Right? If I give it a plus five, it's going to go up by five. So we can actually go up or down depending on what type of stats object we pass in. So uh, we're going to say stats object dot attack uh, is what we want to make it change by. If there is uh, a defense on the stats object, then we want to say this dot stats dot defense is going to get changed by stats object dot defense. Right, and if I scroll down a little bit here, and I say uh, if uh, stats object dot HP, <laughs> that's, that's the last one. Uh, this dot stats dot HP uh, plus equals stats object dot HP. All right, perfect. So that's pretty good. Um, now that's pretty much it for this function, right? Like we we literally call this function, and it's going to change the stats of our player up here with that new data. And it's actually going to manipulate it, which is fantastic. So this is basically our control to change the stats, which is quite nice. Um, and just like before, we're going to also create our describe. Describe. Um, and in here, I'm just going to say const stats is equal to this dot stats. And I'm going to console.log. And this is going to be uh, this part right here where uh, we, we're going to log out the player stats just like this, just like we did for the other ones. So I'm going to say uh, player stats. I can even grab the name, I guess. I'll just go with this, though. Um, I'll do a template, uh, and then I'll say attack is also a template, and then uh, defense uh, is also a template. <laughs> so I can think about that one for a second. Um, yeah, uh, stats.hp, stats.attack, and stats.defense just like we had before. Perfect. And my prettier kicks in there to put it a bit nicely so it fits on the screen. Um, and that's it, right? So uh, that, that's actually our entire player class. So we have a way to have stats for our player. Now, as I mentioned, we could also technically store the coordinates, but we'll just keep it simple for now and store the coordinates in the grid as we've been doing so far. Um, we can uh, get the name, get the stats, most critically change the stats, which is different from our other two uh, enemy and item, but also describe as well. Let's export this. So we'll say export uh, our player. And there we go. So great. 
So we have all of these objects created now, right? That was a lot of coding, uh, very little actually executing <laughs> our code to see uh, what gets um, printed out over here, right? Um, so yeah, let's uh, let's just kind of figure out what to, to do next because that, that was definitely quite a lot. Um, I think that the main purpose, again, behind what we just did was for you to appreciate the fact that these objects are much easier to understand when you give them some context just like real world objects, right? Um, when we're modeling this game, we have items, that's an object. We have enemies, that's an object. We have players, that's an object, right? Um, all these things are objects. Even the map itself is an object as we're seeing, right? The, the grid spots themselves are also objects, right? Um, it's once you start doing this more and more, you start to think of these things in the concepts of OOP, it definitely uh, gives you a bit of appreciation for how this simplifies things because now, each of these things has its own state and it, we don't have to worry about keeping track of all that. It's already being done by those classes. Okay, cool. So uh, now uh, we need to actually figure out, so we, we did the movement, we created all of our objects. Um, we wanna see if we can actually generate our enemies, uh, right? Or or technically, more more specifically, uh, generate our grid objects uh, because we could generate an enemy, an item, or we could actually also generate um, an empty spot. So as we're moving, right, as we're moving through our map, we can add, add, run into th three things. Uh, actually, technically four things. Actually, I guess technically five things. Um, That's a bit tricky. We can run into a spot we've seen before, right, which, in which nothing happens, we get this message. Uh, we can run into the win condition. So we actually have to be aware of that. That's actually one of the one of the very unique things that can happen, which is the whole point of our game, actually. So we shouldn't forget that, right? We can run into this tile and then we win. Uh, but then most of the other times, three things are gonna happen. Um, we're either going to uh, like run into nothing, like an empty spot, like an empty field or something, and we'll get like a coast is clear or something like that, right? Similar thing to this. Um, or we're gonna run into an enemy, uh, or we're gonna run into an item. If we run into an item, we pick it up right away and add its stats to our stats, which we just coded. If we run into an enemy, we're going to go into like a loop where we're gonna keep fighting it until uh, one of us runs out of HP. Okay, and if the enemy runs out of HP without us running out of HP, then we beat it and we can keep moving. But if it damage does during that fight, then we actually lose some HP during the fight, okay? So um, that's that's pretty much what we need to do. So let's, let's see how we can actually generate those objects uh, based on moving to these tiles, okay? And then we can deal with kind of the, the mechanics of the actual fighting. Because once we have the object, uh, we can actually figure out, do we actually even need to do a fight? Do we just pick it up or do we just move on? Okay, so um, let's let's go ahead and do that. I'm gonna come down here. So uh, let me do it like a, below the display grid for now. Um, I'm gonna call this generate grid object, just like that. Now, same as our grid object right here, where we created a random number and had things happen, we're gonna use the same mechanics, okay? So I'm gonna say const random is equal to math.random. So I'm gonna generate a random number between zero and one. I'm also just gonna create this object right here, not grid object, just regular object like that. You'll see why in a second. Now, this is where things get kind of fun. This is also where things get actually kind of challenging. This is really a, a lot of game design it ends up happening here. And, and this is actually where I think a lot of like creativity can happen. So we need to figure out how often do enemies spawn? How often do items spawn? And how often does like nothing happen? Are we like freely running around the field, right? So the the kind of stats that I went with just to kind of test this out were as follows. I'm gonna, I'm gonna say if random is less than 0 0.15, which is 15% of the time, right? Between zero and 0 0.15, uh, if we're between zero and one as a range is 15% of the time, one five, right? Uh, I wanna generate an item object. So I'm gonna say that object is equal to, um, and I think we have to import all these. So let me let me start doing this up here before we actually code this. Um, I'm gonna say import item object, uh, like just like this uh, from item object.js. I had a bit of autocomplete there. Um, I'm gonna say import um, enemy object uh, from enemy object.js, just like that, right? Make sure you have the brackets because we didn't use default export. Um, 
And we might as well just import the player as well. We're going to use that in a second. Uh, we'll import the player from player.js. Okay. So once we have item object and enemy object specifically, we can actually start creating those objects. So if I scroll back down to my generate grid object here, I'm going to say, this object 15% of the time is going to be a new item object. I'm going to pass the item object a sprite and stats. So this is where we actually fill it in. So I'm going to say I'm going to create a sword uh, and I'm going to give it the sword sprite here okay, from my little emoji picker. Um, and I'm going to pass it an object for the stats where the name is going to be sword. Because uh, if you remember from our item object here, we want to pass in all of these values, name, attack, and defense, right? So I'm going to say name is sword. Um, attack, let's just go with three like I have in the images. Defense is one. And then HP is, uh, let's just say, oops, uh, is oops, zero. <laughs> there we go. That was complicated. Um, and that's it, right? That's our... Um, 15% of chance we have an object. So of course we're gonna return this at the end, but we'll see uh, what else we wanna do in a second. Great, now that's 15%. What about the other uh, 85%? Well, I'm gonna say an else if random is less than, I wanted 20% of the time a spider to show up or an enemy to show up, okay? So in order to make that work, since I'm using else if and, and I'm already checking for a bit below 0.15, well, 0.15 plus 20, or plus 0.2 in this case, is 0 0.35. So this is saying uh, between 0.15 and 0.35, which is 20% of the time, uh, I want something else to happen, which object is equal to a new enemy object. We're gonna give it a sprite. And again, if you're scared of spiders, I'm sorry. Um, I'm build a spider, it's a nice simple enemy that we can fight. Um, and if you like spiders, I'm also sorry, you can change it to something else um, that you can fight instead. Um, and we're gonna give this a name uh, and we're gonna say spider and we're gonna say attack. Let's just give it an attack of uh, five. Uh, let, let, let's actually just make it so we can't actually like die in this case. So I'm gonna be a little bit uh, overpowered here uh, when we add our player. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna give it more stats than 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 we can actually get defeated by <laughs> just to test it out. Um, I think when I was originally testing this, I made my spider like way too powerful. And uh, I actually never got a chance to win, um, which was uh, very sad. So I had to I had to kind of nerf the, the spider or buff myself to actually make it work. Um, but uh, anyways, this is 0.15% uh, of the time um, or 0.15, which is 15% of the time is a, we're getting an item. In this case, we only have one item, which is what I mentioned in the requirements, which is a sword. Uh, the other 20% of the time we're getting a spider. Uh, and now uh, the rest of the time, right? So. Uh, this would be like, what, 65% uh, of the time, uh, we would uh, have the else in this case. Uh, so 65% of the time, we're gonna just say that nothing happens. Object is equal to a new grid object, regular grid object. Um, and this is not an item object, this is not an enemy object. Uh, and we're just gonna say that you have uh, discovered this with some paw prints. Okay, and we're gonna say this is discovered. Just like that. And we should really probably create a method to do this, but uh, again, we should probably do that for many things in here. Then I'm gonna return the object that we create. That's why I created it as a let, um, so we can assign it here. Uh, technically, we do return each of these, but um, I like this syntax a little bit more. It's a bit more clear, at least in my opinion, what's happening. So 15% of the time, we have an item. 20% uh, of the time, we have a spider, which is between 0.15 and 35. And then the rest of the time, so 65% of the time, we have our, uh, grid object, which is just a regular discovery. So nothing actually happens, right? And then the describe on this is going to be one of these uh, flavor texts. Okay, the describe on spider is different. The describe on a sword is different. Okay, so that's pretty good. So um, yeah, let's, uh, let's, let's see what happens. Let, let's actually uh, start using this now and actually see if our stuff actually works. So in order to um, generate this, we just need to call this function, right? So I'm gonna start moving down to our move player right here. Um, and we we kind of had a placeholder for this, right? We said this dot current object is equal to a new grid object. Um, so in this case, I'm gonna comment this back in. And instead of a new uh, grid object, I'm gonna replace this with uh, this dot generate grid object. 
Okay. Um, and you'll see why in a second we're going to create a field for this because we want to be able to access it from another method. Technically, we could create a parameter or an argument as well, but I'm just going to go with this uh, because it might be nice to have in other places without always having to pass it in. So we're going to generate this grid object every single time. Um, and then technically we can we can describe it. So for example, I can say this dot current object dot uh, describe. Um, and then that will actually get it to um, print out hopefully what's in there. So I'm going to copy this these two lines of code, I'm just going to paste it again into these other places right here. So there we go, I'm going to paste it right there for uh, what was that that was for uh, move right, uh, I'm going to do for up uh, right here at the bottom of each of these methods, uh, and then right here as well. Okay, so let's see what happens. So I'm going to, um, again, this is just generating the object and then running the description um, to see what happens. We're not actually doing any fighting yet, right? Because we haven't actually done that code. That's the next and last step of this actual uh, project. So moment of truth, let's see what happens. Uh, so it's a bit cut off, right, by my, by my screen. You can see that we're actually getting some things happening here, right? Uh, we have a, uh, you found a sword. Uh, we see the sword stats. A lot of uh, coast is clear. Uh, you found a sword and a lot more coast is clear. We did actually find an enemy during this entire uh, experience. Let me run this one more time. Um, it ran off my screen here. Uh, there we go, right? So um, we, we found a sword. Uh, we found an enemy, an enemy, a sword, uh, and then uh, an enemy here again. So it cut off on my screen, but uh, hopefully you can see that we're actually generating these things uh, properly and we're even printing out their stats as we go. Now, of course, we want to actually update the grid. Um, to uh, show us moving one step at a time. So that we kind of need to kind of do this turn by turn, right? Because if you think about how we're doing this right now, this would never work this way in, in our real game because the player is only going to be able to move one at a time. We're basically doing like all these moves instantly all at once, right? So that's why we're seeing so many of these happen. Um, but uh, eventually when we actually get this to uh, be very manual where the player is selecting one of the uh, up, down, left, or right, then this is going to happen like one step at a time and we can update our grid. Okay, so that's pretty great. I mean, look at this, like this is already quite nice, right? Like we have, right, just to appreciate <laughs> this because even getting to this stage is, is quite amazing. And I just want to point out a couple of really interesting things. Um, we're getting our emojis printed out and then uh, the description for that thing that we run into. Sometimes we're just getting like the uh, the flavor text for the empty grid cells. And sometimes we're running into an enemy and then we're seeing the enemy stats, right? So item stats uh, and description and enemy stats and description and then just regular flavor text, right? So that's happening uh, because we're calling describe on the generated object. And since every type of grid object, regardless of if it's a, a, this grid object, which has this describe or these grid objects, uh, which are item objects or enemy objects, since they extend grid object, they're going to also have a describe, but we override the describe in these classes. And that's where polymorphism takes into effect. So depending on the type of grid object that we find, if it's an item, an enemy or a regular grid object, we can get a different type of description, which is really amazing, right? That's like truly quite awesome. And that's the polymorphism effect uh, in play. No pun intended. <laughs> okay, so uh, let's let's kind of go with uh, one of the final parts of this, right? We we want to make it now that we have an ability to generate uh, items um, and generate enemies. We want to figure out like what do we do with this, right? Like when we generate a sword, what do we do with it? When we hit an enemy, what do we do with it, right? So we kind of need this concept of a turn, right? So we need to like like make it so when you move. Like we, we do all this logic for that turn based on what object was generated. So when I move over here, if I find a sword, we have to add the sword stats to my stats. If we find nothing, great. We move over there and, not, and we just see the coast is clear. Um, if we find an enemy, that's where things get interesting. And we have to actually uh, do some kind of game loop calculation to see if we uh, beat the enemy or not. So let's go ahead and start with that. So I'm going to go back to my grid. And what I'm going to do is right below my generate grid object function is I'm going to add a, another function, which is going to take care of our turns. And in my uh, kind of notes here, I call that execute turn. So I'm just going to go with that. 
give myself some space up here. Um, I'm going to call this execute turn. This is going to take no arguments. Now, this is going to run every single time that uh, we move spots in this map, right? So let's 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 think about what the possibilities are. The possibilities are we find an item, we find a sword, or so we find an enemy. Uh, we find nothing. Uh, we backtracked but also found nothing, or we hit the win condition. So let's do the win condition first, okay? So we're gonna say, if this.grid at, and this is again, a lot of repetitive code, we can probably reduce this uh, with some extra functionality, this.player y, so this is our current location, this.player x, just want to put this in here so that we can appreciate that we, do, we should refactor this in the future. We can check to see the type, which is the tag that we have, because every single one of our slots in our grid has been filled with a grid object. All of them has a type. The type for our um, equals 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 for our uh, star is win. That's the type, right? So let's actually check that. So if the type is win, well, what do we want to do? Well, we want to log that we won, right? So we're going to say console.log and I'm going to say, uh, let's do template string here. I'm going to say, where is it? Streamers, <laughs> congrats. You reached the end of the game. And I'm going to put a little party hat, all right? And I don't want to return here. I actually want to quit node entirely so that we don't have a chance to put any more input. Now, uh, you should definitely Google for how to do this, but the, the way to actually exit the entire node process is process.exit. Uh, and, and this is just in node specifically, okay? And this will this is like compressing control C, basically, in the node process, okay? Um, and if you were to Google like how to quit node, for example, or how to stop the node program from running, you would uh, probably see this as one of the first results, whether on Stack Overflow or the documentation or something like that. So this is going to exit our uh, entire program. Okay, uh, very similar to how a break breaks the whole loop. This is basically breaking the entire node process. So nothing else happens and the program just stops and we go back to our terminal. Okay, perfect. So uh, that's uh, kind of dealing with this case. And we, we wanna do that so that when we win, we win. Like we, we've won, we, we have to start a new game in order to kind of continue. So what's the other option? Well, if we've discovered this tile before, right? So like, um, let, let me, uh, like the, the paw prints, right? So if we say, if this dot current object dot type, um, and actually, actually not this dot current object, sorry, this dot, this at, uh, this dot grid, getting confused myself here, this dot grid at this dot player y, at this dot player x dot type, uh, and instead of win, we want to check if it's equal to discovered. Right? So if it is equal to discovered, then that means that we've been here before. Right? Or, or it means that technically, um, like this is a, a coast is clear kind of situation, right? Where the um, like if we think about this, like let's say we go back to where's our object. Uh, if we hit this condition, where we we say that we walk to the spot without generating our spider, without generating our item, then we're setting the tag to be discovered, right? And nothing is going to happen in this part apart from the description being logged out. So what we want to do in this case is we want to grab that object and call the describe on it. Uh, so I'm going to say dot describe, just like that. Okay. And this is possible because before we call this execute turn, uh, which we're going to do shortly, uh, we're going to be generating it and setting it to this dot current object. So we're basically doing this. I'm just going to do it inside of this execute turn so I can actually get rid of this from here and just do something else, which is call this execute turn actually. <laughs> uh, 
Um, okay, um, so once that's done, then I can return because this done, uh, this turn is basically done. We don't actually have to do any calculations apart from moving the player, which we already did. Um, and we can kind of figure out what to do in our next turn right away and prompt the player for another input. Okay, so this is a, these are the kind of simpler cases. Now, let's think about the other case. So the other case is that we run into an item. So let's do that. So we're gonna say if, and I'm gonna say this dot grid or sorry, this dot current object, uh, because we're going to be generating an object uh, and we're going to be setting it to uh, this dot current object, right? So if the current object is an item, I guess technically, actually, now that I think about this, um, this is probably this dot current object because it hasn't actually been put there. So I should probably put this dot uh, current object always gets confusing what I'm tracking and where I'm tracking it. So this is already on the grid. Um, this is the current object that we have just um, ran over. And I guess, where am I checking for? Oh, we're already checking here. I totally forgot about that. We're already checking in this function uh, if we're, uh, we've already seen this spot before. Um, so so that that's, um, where, where was it? Sorry, not there. Oh my gosh, I'm going, I'm going a bit crazy. Right here, this one, right here. That's what I was looking for. If we've already discovered this uh, spot before, um, then we're 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 good to go. Like we don't actually need to uh, do anything. So we, we kind of dealt with that case here. The, the 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 one where we're dealing with here. Sorry, this is very confusing. There's a lot of state happening. Um, is the, the, where we generate the object and it's a new spot. So when we move to a new spot. Um, and that is uh, the case 65% of the time in this case where we uh, don't have anything. We want to just say the coast is clear, for example. Okay, so uh, this dot current object dot type here, if that is equal to item, and this is where things are gonna get really fun and interesting. So if we run into an item, what do we wanna do? Well, we wanna kind of explain that we ran into an item. So we're gonna do describe again. So we're gonna say this dot current object dot describe. And again, a lot of re repetition here, we could probably uh, create a method for this. I'm gonna grab the item stats. So I'm gonna say const item stats is equal to this dot current object dot get stats. Then I want to add it to the player's stats. All right, so we don't actually have our player yet. Um, so let's go and create our player um, so that we can actually kind of see what's going to happen when we actually add this to our stats. So I'm going to come up to my constructor here and you can see that we already imported a player. So make sure we do that if you haven't done that yet. I'm going to say this dot player is equal to a new player and our player needs to have a name. I'm going to call mine the monkey king. <laughs> All right. And I'm gonna give my player some stats. Uh, I'm gonna make him a little bit uh, overpowered in this case. Uh, defense of five, just so that he can't get damaged really by our spider. Um, and let's give HP of a 20, a little bit strong, a little bit strong. Maybe not too strong, but strong enough that he, he can't really die in this case, uh, in this map with this spider. All right, but we're gonna assign that to the instance of this dot player. All right, so once we have that, what we can do is actually add to the player's statistics, right? So uh, I'm gonna come down to this function and I'm going to figure out how to add these item stats to our actual player. So let's, let's think about our actual player for a second. If we go to our player file, what did we have? Well, we had this add to stats, we pass it a stats object, and as long as that stats object has an attack, defense, and HP, uh, it will it will change that player's stats directly, right? Using this dot private stats. Um, so we can actually do that. So I'm going to say um, this dot player dot add to stats, and I'm just going to pass it the item stats directly. So in this case, the item stats are going to be uh, attack, defense, and strength. If you think about it. Attack, defense, sorry, and HP. I always say strength, I'm not sure why. Um, attack, defense, and HP. And that's gonna be added directly here to our player. Okay. So uh, then uh, we basically wanna return because we don't wanna actually go through the rest of our function. 
uh, where we're gonna actually see our enemy. Okay, so when we're down here, this is our enemy, okay? Uh, at least in this case, I'm not gonna do an if statement, I'm just gonna keep it kind of pretty open uh, because there's already a lot of code in here. Now, arguably, again, I've said this a whole bunch of times, this would probably make sense to put in its own um, method, but I'm just gonna put it all in here just so we can have all our turn stuff in one method, but probably uh, too long of a method in this case already. Uh, if we run into an enemy, I'm going to do a this dot current object dot describe. And this is where the logic gets really, really trippy. So let's go through this a bit carefully. I'm going to say const enemy stats is equal to this dot current object dot get stats. Okay. Um, and that is going to be the, the case when we're not an item, when we're not discovered and when we're not win right? Not discovered, uh, not an item, and not uh, win in this case. So basically this option right here. Uh, so we need to figure out uh, the enemy stats, our stats, and then kind of uh, the, the difference when we, when we fight each other. So uh, let's grab uh, the enemy's name real quick. So I'm going to say const enemy name is equal to this dot current object dot get name. There we go. Uh, I'm going to say const player stats. So we need the player stats so that we can actually do a stat comparison. Um, this dot player dot get stats. Okay. Now here's where things get kind of interesting. And this took me a little while. I actually ran into a couple bugs as I ran this code, like infinite loops and things like that in certain cases. If you think about how this works, um, let's go to our requirements real quick. Down here, what we had was the way that damage is calculated is attack minus defense. So um, my attack as a player minus the defense of the enemy and then vice versa. The enemy is going to attack us. So it's going to be the enemy's attack and then minus our defense as a player. Okay. So if you think about it, if the enemy's defense is larger than our attack, there is no way we'll ever beat the enemy, right? Well, we'd never win against the enemy. Uh, so we just immediately lose. So we can actually create a case to check for that directly because in certain edge cases, this might actually end up being like almost like an infinite loop. So we're going to say enemy stats dot defense. If their defense is greater than our attack, right? Uh, then I'm just going to console dot log. Um, you lose <laughs> very harsh. Uh, and I'm going to say um, enemy name uh, was too powerful. Okay. And I'm going to exit the node process, process.exit. Okay. So that's going to handle that case. Then what I want to do is I actually want to create this loop where we're going to be fighting against them. So if we know that we can actually damage them, now we can actually do this loop where we're going to be um, fighting against this enemy. All right. So how do we do that? Well, to start, I'm going to just show you something that I did. I'm going to uh, create a variable called total player damage just to keep track of how much damage is incoming to the player over time. But what we want to really do is do a loop while the enemy stats dot HP is greater than zero. So while the enemy still has some health points remaining, we want to do the player to the enemy damage and the enemy to the player damage. So I, I call these kind of some strange long names. I'm going to see enemy, enemy, uh, damage turn. Oh my gosh, I can't spell damage turn, uh, is equal to player attack. This, no, no, sorry. Player stats, player stats dot attack minus enemy stats dot defense, right? So, um, the amount of damage that we're doing to the spider in this case is our attack as a player minus the spider's defense as an enemy, right? Um, and then vice versa, right? So for the const player damage turn is going to equal to the reverse. So enemy stats, uh, dot attack minus our defense. So player stats dot defense. All right. Now, if the enemy damage turn is greater than zero, then we're going to say enemy uh, stats dot HP. I should probably put this in a, there we go. Enemy stats dot HP 
uh, minus equals enemy damage turn. Um, and this is just to make sure that we can't do any like crazy, uh, like negative, uh, negative numbers, healings and things like that just for now. Um, and we'll say if uh, player damage turn is greater than zero, same thing. Um, we're gonna say player stats dot HP is going to minus equal player damage turn. So we're gonna subtract the amount of damage we took that turn uh, from our stats HP. What I'm also gonna do though is keep track of how much damage is being done to the player in total over all of these loops, because this loop could go a bunch of times depending on how many uh, attack and defense our enemies and our player have. So I'm gonna say total player damage is gonna go up by the player damage turn, which you'll see uh, why in a second. Okay, so after this while loop, so after these turns have elapsed, that means our enemy HP has now gone below zero. Okay, or, or zero or less. Um, if our player stats dot HP is less than or equal to zero, right? So if during this process of trying to defeat the enemy, uh, we actually also lost all our HP, technically we should lose, right? So I'm gonna say console.log, um, you lose, same thing, uh, enemy name was too powerful. Now hopefully you're seeing that this is very repetitive again, many uh, opportunities to make this code a little bit neater, uh, and we're gonna exit the process immediately so we don't actually have to go any further. If we get past all of this, that means that the enemy lost all their HP, our player still has health, so we're actually still alive. Um, so we want to actually subtract the amount of damage that we took. Even though it's not all the way to zero, we still need to actually make uh, penalize our player for taking damage. So we're gonna say this dot player dot add to stats, and this is where it gets a bit uh, funky because we can say our HP, we wanna add to our HP, but we're gonna add a negative number to subtract from our HP. So I'm gonna add uh, total player damage, just like that. The amount of damage that we took from the enemy over time, because we're not actually changing the player's HP here. This is just a copy, remember. Okay. Then we're gonna say console.log, uh, we're gonna say you defeated the, and then enemy name. And I'm gonna say your updated stats. And I'm gonna say this.player.describe. Okay, which is gonna log out the player stats, which we wrote earlier. And that's it. That's this entire function. I say that's it, but this is a gigantic method. Um, really, really a lot of logic going on. In fact, this is pretty much the, uh, a big part of this entire app is this method right here. Okay, now again, I, sh I have to say this a bunch of times. It's, it's not probably possible to come up with something like this right away. It's gonna take a lot of iteration, a lot of frustration, a lot of back and forth, testing things, trying things, uh, things breaking. Uh, eventually you'll land on some solution. This is just one possible solution. This is not the only way to do it by any means. In fact, this is a probably pretty bad way to do it. It just works. Okay, great. So what we wanna do now is actually make it so that uh, we execute this turn as we're, as we're going through the grid. So I'm gonna minimize this function here. I'm also gonna minimize the generate grid object just so I'm not moving too much up and down here. And over here, where we're doing this dot current object dot describe, I'm going to say this dot execute turn instead. Okay. So same thing for all these methods. We don't need to do the describe anymore. I'm going to say this dot execute turn because the describe is happening in there. Uh, and again, this is happening in every single one of these functions, which is super annoying. Uh, and this is why we need to kind of clean this up if we were to add to this um, going forward. So I'm going to say this right here dot execute turn. Okay, now let's see what happens if we actually run this. So I'm going to clear my console here. Let's go ahead and run this. Let's see what we get. Fingers crossed. So, oh, <laughs> wow. so anticlimactic. Um, okay, so something funky is happening here. We encountered a spider in this Spider was too powerful, so we lost, which seems kind of strange because I'm pretty sure we hacked our game so that we can't lose, but something is buggy. So we have 10 attack, 5 defense, and uh, 20 HP. 
uh, which which actually means that the, sp <laughs> the spider shouldn't be able to damage us at all. So something weird is happening here. So let's let's debug this like while we're at it. Why not? Uh, you probably noticed something as along the way. I must have messed it up somewhere. Um, let's come down to our execute turn function. Um, and you know, like maybe like right above here, let's just like log out what our stats are. So I'm gonna I'm gonna do uh, console.log. Uh, let's do it like actually right right after here. So I'll do uh, right after here. Let me let me log out all these values. So I'm gonna say console.log uh, enemy enemy stats and then uh, like I don't know player player stats. Just just so just so we can uh, do like a sanity check that we uh, have some correct values here and our math isn't wrong. You can look through the math in a second. So. Uh, Okay, so yeah, something something really fishy is going on. As you can see, um, the second one is our player stats. Our player stats are zero, zero, zero. So something must be kind of messed up with our constructor or something, uh, because um, like if you recall, this is like our default values for for attack, defense, and HP. So this is why it's always nice also to provide default values so you can actually see stuff like this, right? So this obviously is not the 10, five, and 20 that we passed in. So something is weird with how we're creating our player. So let's take a look at our player um, and let's kind of go through here. So here's our stats. So we're getting these logged out. Uh, here's our constructor. Uh, oh, okay, there, there it is, I see it. it that's, a, that's a really tricky one. So, um, we have this dot hashtag stats, our private stats. Uh, this dot stats is totally different than this dot hashtag stats, right? Um, we don't actually have a this dot stats uh, technically uh, because our um, well, we, we would have had it in this case if we did it, but we're actually returning uh, when we call get stats from this dot hashtag stats. So that was the issue. We weren't setting the correct thing here because we were setting the non private field. Um, so now I have a feeling. Um, if we if we run this, let's see what we get. Okay, so uh, a lot of stuff. We actually won the game in this case. Let me bring take out those logs. Wow, uh, where is uh, where is my where did that log go? Where did I put it? These ones. Let's get rid of those. Um, let me let me let me run this one more time, and let's see what happens. All right, so check it out. Right, we we win. Um, so there's a couple of still weird things in here, right? So um, when we are hitting the spots, uh, we need to, uh, like in this case, it's fine. But in, in this case here, when we find a sword and we, we find a sword, we're not actually showing our own stats. So we need a way to actually show like the updated player stats. So that shouldn't be too bad. Um, and then we, we get the, the, the UN. So let me try this one more time, see what we get. Uh, there we go. We find out we found a sword. Uh, we found another sword. Let's just try to find an enemy and see if that works. Um, okay, we won. We keep winning this game. Maybe it's too easy. Oh my gosh, we, we that was a that was a clear coast. There's nothing along the way. There we go. So um, we have our enemy. You defeated the spider this time. We didn't lose instantly. Uh, can't do a spider. We defeated the spider. Um, and, and there we go. So we didn't lose any stats, as you can see, right? Our because we're we're basically invincible uh, against the spider. Uh, so we'll, we'll change that as we as we kind of add to this game to make it so we can actually have a fair fight for this spider. Okay, so, so that's pretty good, right? Some debugging as well in there for us. So that's, that's pretty awesome. So now, really, if you if you think about it, we're, we're pretty close to actually finishing this game. The only thing that we really need is the way to have the player actually give us their input. Because we don't, we don't wanna like hard code like all of this, right? Uh, like we don't want this. Uh, so let's comment this out for now and uh, figure out a way to actually uh, get the player's input. So the inquirer package is the one that we're going to be using. I'm going to create a new file for this. Uh, I'm going to call this um, player prompts.js. Um, and we used the inquire package previously in our uh, series where we looked at the, uh, like, for example, the Pokemon. Uh, CLI that we made um, and uh, like I would encourage you to read through the NPM documentation for that and all that kind of stuff I don't want to uh, make this video even longer by going through that since we did a bit of that in that video um, So let's just kind of code this out because it's a relatively short one We're only asking for one set of inputs in this case. So uh, we need to actually uh, import this So if we go to our package JSON clear my console here I'm gonna run NPM install the name of the package is inquirer inquirer like this Okay um, and that's on NPM. Uh, we're gonna get it installed. We're gonna get our package lock. You can see that it's been installed here in our dependency list, which is great. Now we can actually import it. So we're gonna say import 
inquirer from inquirer. There's no uh, .js because this is importing it from our node modules, as you can see right there. Okay, so uh, I'm going to create an async function because this deals with promises, just so I can use await in here. I'm going to call this prompt uh, player for a direction, prompt player for a direction. And in here, I'm going to say const results. And this is uh, all to do with inquire, not really that interesting, to be honest. Uh, we're just kind of making it easier for us to have that nice interface for the up, down, left, and right with the arrow keys to choose a, a direction. You can also do this without this package. Um, so really the code that we write here is not that really relevant apart from just the basic kind of reading documentation and trying to get it working um, by looking at examples and things like that, okay? So I wouldn't uh, fret too much about this code because it's not really that important. So um, we're gonna say await, uh, uh, sorry, await uh, inquire because this returns a promise dot prompt I'm going to pass it a question, uh, which in this case, they, they have this in their documentation. This is going to be a list type question. Uh, we're going to have a name for this question. It's going to be direction. Um, and then we're going to have a message. Uh, we're going to say, which direction would you like to travel? Um, and that's our message. Uh, and then we're going to have our choices, which is really the, the interesting part of this, which is going to be an array of all the different strings. So we're going to say up, uh, down, Say let me just any order really that you like, uh, left and right. All right, there we go, and that's it. And then uh, the direction is going to be the name of the uh, prop that comes in results. So we're going to return uh, results dot direction. So we're going to actually get um, we're going to get uh, up, down, left, or right as a string back from this promise, and we're just going to export that. So that that's really it for this function. Okay. There we go. Um, so now we can use this inside of our grid. So I'm going to import that in our grid here at the top. I'm going to say import prompt player for direction uh, from dot slash player player prompts dot js. Um, and this is kind of the last part of our code. We're going to create a method that is going to deal with actually um, kind of like starting off this game. Okay, uh, like basically doing all this stuff for us. Uh, since it's async, we can't actually put it uh, in here because we can't await it. Um, so I'm actually going to put it, uh, we can't do an await inside the constructor is what I meant to say. And so I'm gonna create an async function down here. I'm gonna call that start game, just so we can see how that might work if you need to refer to async code from the constructor. Um, and uh, I'm gonna say while this dot player. So while the player dot get stats dot HP is greater than zero. So this is just a second check. Technically, we are checking for this in all of our other parts of our execute turn. Uh, but just for some reason, in case we end up here with less than zero HP, uh, we should also quit the game. Um, we want to do what? Well, we want to display the grid every single turn to update and refresh the grid. Um, and then we're going to say const response is equal to, so we can use await in here for our async. Um, and we want to prompt player for a direction. Here we're going to get an up, down, left, or right string. And we're going to be able to use that to determine which, which one of these methods to call. We actually have all the logic, right? I'm going to use a switch statement for this, uh, just to make it a bit easier. So I'm going to say switch on that response. And I'm going to do uh, all our cases. So I'm going to say case up. Uh, this dot move player up and then break so that we don't accidentally uh, hit the other cases. Uh, we're going to say case uh, down and the capitalization does matter here. Um, it does, it does, it is caps sensitive, uh, case sensitive. Uh, this dot move player down and uh, we're going to break. And then if we go uh, left, The order doesn't actually really matter here. Move player left and then break. And then finally uh, to the right. So um, if we're moving to the right here, then we're gonna do this dot move player right. Right? Uh, so this this reads quite nicely. Like if you look at this, like, okay, prompt for the direction, right? Which direction you wanna go, move that direction, uh, and then and then display the grid again. Right? So this is quite a nice game loop. This actually kind of makes a lot of sense, right? Uh, notice we don't have a default case in our break or in our, in our uh, switch um, uh, because technically you should always have a default case. Um, but 
in this case, we really only are getting up, down, left, or right from that inquirer, right? Because those are the only four possible options. So I'm not going to put a default in here, but it's best practice to really put a default like that was not a valid selection or something as well. We could log out and like process.exit or move to the next turn or something like that, depending on how you want to structure your game. Okay. Um, and then at the very end of this, uh, we're going to, uh, uh, at the end of this um, switch before the next loop around, we're just going to do a nice console log. Uh, and I'm just going to put a bunch of these dashes uh, just so that we can get. Um, that uh, kind of separation of the, the renders between the previous display grid and our new one. Uh, just so it's a little bit neater. You don't have to do that, but I'm just gonna put that in there just, just for, for nicety's sake. Um, and what we can do now is we can kind of comment out all this stuff here. In fact, I'm actually gonna get rid of all this stuff. Um, all of this display grid stuff and all that movement of player stuff that we had, uh, we can replace with this one call. We're gonna say this dot start the game. <laughs> Right? Just start the game and run the game loop. And this is going to be uh, basically an infinite loop, almost not really infinite, but while the player uh, has either not lost the game, which is why we need to play process dot exit um, uh, or, or won the game or while their HP is zero so they can keep moving around. OK, um, so that is pretty much it, actually. Right. Um, I'm pretty sure that is it. Uh, I might have missed one or two things, uh, but let, let's see what we get. So um, if uh, if we run this, fingers crossed, right? Fingers crossed, we actually get our game working. So I'm gonna run node grid and okay, okay, okay. So which direction do you wanna travel? I want to go, I wanna go right. Okay, uh, that's pretty good. Coast is clear. Nice. Uh, I didn't get my player stats logged out, so I think I'm gonna fix that. But I'm gonna clear this console here. Then I'm gonna go down. Can't move down. Okay. I'm gonna go up. I encountered a spider. I defeated the spider. Right. That's that's working. Right. So that, that's pretty good. So I just want to fix this uh, player stats thing. So I can control C to get out of this really quick. So in order to actually log out the player stats every single time the the grid is displayed as well, um, we should probably do. Um, in our display grid right here. So you see how we're calling display grid. I want to actually log out these player stats. So if we look back here, I want to be able to log out the stats just so we have that for context as to how we're doing uh, so far. So if I go back here uh, in my display grid at the very start, I'm going to say this dot player dot uh, uh, describe. Right. And then we can actually uh, log out the rest of that stuff. So let's try this again. Let's see what we get. Um, you know what? Let's also make our uh, spider a little bit stronger here. So I don't know. Let's let's give it uh, 15, 15 attack. Let's make it super OP. Um, I think hopefully we can survive that. We'll see. I don't want to do math in my head right now. Um, so uh, if I if I run this, um, we should get our map. OK, OK, so I'm going to go right. OK, this is clear. I'm going to clear my console so you can actually see it uh, pop up properly. Then I'm going to go right again. Coast is clear up. Okay, coast is clear is a pretty boring game so far. I'm gonna go right. Okay, I found a sword. Okay, up. Spider. Okay, thank thank goodness I found the sword first. Right, that was that's kind of scary. Now you can see, um, that was a very powerful spider. My 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 stats dropped from twenty thirteen and six to eleven thirteen and six. So I took nine damage from that spider. Right. Uh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna go up again. Okay, I'm gonna go up again. Oh, you know, there's a spider again. Um, now I have two health left. <laughs> I got two health, right? Because that's my uh, second uh, interaction with our spider. But now I can actually go to the right and I win the game because I finally made it through the map. Um, that was pretty clutch. Uh, I guess it could have been a little bit more clutch if I, you know, uh, encountered that spider or something. But that was that was pretty good, right? That was a good way to kind of um, end that off. So we picked up a sword. Uh, we were able to defeat two spiders and just got away with a sliver of health and we're able to get to the end of the game. Uh, so that's pretty good. So definitely play around with it. You can actually change the size of the map right down here. Uh, you can make a super, super uh, large map, for example. Um, you can change the uh, player attack defense, the different types of items. You can add more items if you want, which adds a bit of complexity as well and logic that we have to add in here. You can change the frequency of the encounters uh, and all that stuff to really make the game a little bit more interesting. Um, but that that's really it, right? Like that, like like look at this grid. Like this is this is pretty nice, right? Um, like we 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 are able to move around 
in this game and, th and that just that just feels uh really really awesome right uh i just died. i just died in that case uh so sad uh let, let's end it with that one um so i'll i'll, I'll switch back here actually to um my uh regular camera for a second just to kind of because this is our last um video in this entire series um and i just want to mention like you know good job honestly like really uh for getting through all these videos if you made it through this entire javascript in that series uh really well done right um that's there's a lot of content to go through very challenging content all the exercises were definitely quite in depth right uh with uh, the name of the course um and uh, quite frankly, uh, if you were able to even absorb most of it, right, like say 80 plus percent of it or whatever, um, I would say that you're in a really, really good spot, right? I, I think not enough uh, new developers appreciate this vanilla JavaScript, right? This is a very powerful language and understanding this language is going to go such a long way to working with anything in web development. For front end, back end, it doesn't matter, right? Um, in fact, I would go as far as saying is this is actually going to help you learn even other languages much, much faster, right? Um, you're going to see a lot of the concepts come up, the OOP style of stuff, the functional style of stuff, map, filter, and reduce, all that kind of stuff you'll see happen again and again, variables, loops, functions. Uh, you're going to see them in every language. And um, once you build more projects and uh, especially things that are more scoped out like this and a bit more complex, they don't even always have to be web applications like this one. Um, you will get really, really good experience and just getting through even this course, you're already very, very far ahead because when it comes to looking at new technologies, like for example, in the next series, we're going to go through the DOM, which is on the front end and then into a technology called React. Um, a lot of stuff just makes more sense, right? Um, you're gonna be looking at code and you're gonna be able to tell the difference between what this new tool is giving us on top of JavaScript, very similar to how we saw kind of this inquirer package has its own stuff on top of JavaScript. Um, but we know also what's in actual JavaScript itself. And, and that sounds kind of trivial, but knowing the difference between the core of the language and then all these different libraries that we're using is so important, especially in the world of web development, because a lot of this stuff gets kind of conjoined together uh, because there's so much to learn and everyone wants to get through it so quickly um, that if, if you don't really appreciate and understand the core language behind all this technology, it becomes very challenging to go super deep into any one of them because it's very hard to piece apart what is JavaScript and what is this framework or a new tool, what is the front end, what is the back end. Um, but now, Hopefully, you have a really good understanding of the core of JavaScript. We went through most of what you'll ever see pretty much anywhere when you're working with the JavaScript language. We didn't go through everything. There are some even more advanced things that, that I'd love to create um, you know, specialized videos on. But everything that you'll see day to day, pretty much, we have covered. And honestly, I can't say this enough. Good job for getting through it. It was a total blast making these videos. Uh, hopefully my passion uh, came across in the videos. Um, and this is the end of our JavaScript in-depth series, uh, but I'm really excited to start a new series next. It's probably gonna be the DOM series. We're gonna go to the front end uh, and work with the browser and the browser's tools and actually see how JavaScript actually helps us in that context and how it's different from Node.js. So. Um, thank you for kind of taking this uh, coding journey with me through this JavaScript course and kind of trusting me to, to teach you all this stuff. Um, I, I truly, truly had a blast and it really is a passion of mine to, to teach this stuff. And I love uh, JavaScript and web development and any kind of development, frankly. Um, so uh, I uh, thank you for joining me on this journey and I can't wait to see you in some of the other series that we have on the channel. I'd love to hear from you in the comments what you thought overall of this series. Um, as well, you can join uh, some of our uh, other channels like the Discord to chat in there and join the community. Um, so until the actual next series and the other videos, uh, I will see you later. Well done. Ciao.